The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Jennifer Schaus here coming to you live today from Washington, D.C., and we're going to jump into a fun webinar on subcontracting. This is our first webinar of 2023, and we're glad that everybody was able to join us. So a quick blurb about us. We are based in downtown D.C. and provide variety of services for established government contractors. Uh, you can see some of the services listed here on your screen. Uh, we also put on events for government contractors, uh, some conferences throughout the year, uh, and of course, webinars. Uh, we've got almost 600 webinars all related to government contracting on our YouTube channel. Uh, we've covered every section of the FAR, every section of the DFARS, all of the FAR supplements, and then a lot of strategic topics on marketing, subcontracting, GSA schedules, proposal writing, pricing, uh, and many of those webinars are covered by some of the speakers that you're going to hear from today. All of the webinars that are on our YouTube channel are complimentary, and you can also always find the PowerPoint on our slideshare.net site. Today's webinar uh, will also uh, be recorded. You can find it on our YouTube channel. And I believe that we have already uploaded our PowerPoint to the slideshare.net site. So if you're looking for any content um, and you want to follow along today with a uh, printout, you can hop over again to slideshare.net. We've got a newsletter that goes out every Monday. It reaches almost 25,000 uh, subscribers, most of which are government contractors. Uh, we do have advertising options in our newsletter. Uh, our LinkedIn followers are up to, I think it's we're over 25,000 now. Uh, if you want information on advertising or sponsoring any webinars, just send us an email to the hello at jenniferschaus.com uh, website or email address. Today's webinar actually kicked off uh, a series of 40 webinars that we will start next week covering the top 40 government contractors. Uh, what we'll look at is the company profile, their contracting trends, how they're doing in the defense sector versus civilian, uh, opportunities to subcontract with these large businesses and other information that's relevant to working with those primes. If you want to sign up for those, it's on our website. And here's the full schedule. Again, this is on our website. Uh, if you go over to jenniferschaus.com and just navigate to the section that says top 40, uh, these are going to be every Wednesday at 12. They are complimentary. And I already covered the topics that we're, uh, we're going to cover on each of these companies. Okay, uh, I would be failing to do my job here if I didn't mention that we've got our first networking event of 2023 coming up. Our events are typically quarterly, so this is our spring soiree over at the Kennedy Center. Uh, this should say Monday, March 20th um, from 5.30 to 7.30, so pardon the, uh, the Friday there, it's actually a Monday. Um, and let's dig into today's uh, content and also thank uh, our sponsors, the Virginia PTAC, which is now, uh, all the PTACs are going to be converting over to something called Apex Accelerators. And uh, we also want to thank MyGovWatch. So a little bit about the Virginia PTAC. Uh, Virginia PTAC at George Mason University offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to established GovCon firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore the services. Uh, review recommendations, register for trainings, and find useful links to agencies and other self-directed learning. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. One-on-one -on -one counseling is limited to eligible client companies. So again, thanks to the Virginia PTAC for participating as a sponsor today. Uh, our next sponsor is Gov, um, MyGovWatch. Uh, in more than 200 industries, MyGovWatch is, a revo is revolutionizing traditional bid notification by serving up RFP leads at a double the rate of government-sponsored sites at a fraction of the cost of legacy websites. Large government contracts don't start with a solicitation, but all roads lead to one and your budget for hearing about RFPs does not have to be thousands of dollars per year. Whoever you're looking to do business with in government at any level, MyGovWatch can tell you who's buying what you sell. Go to MyGovWatch.com to start your 14-day free trial. Okay, so today we are covering subcontracting with the primes. 
Uh, here's our agenda. It's pretty tight. We've got uh, 30 minutes, minutes for each of the six sessions. Uh, two speakers for each session, and we'll just go ahead and dig into market research. We've got Ashley Duell and Jim Sherwood. Uh, I want to thank Ashley for joining us today. Ashley, I'll uh, turn the mic over to you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for having me, and thank you to Jim for co-presenting with me. Um, I'm, I've been in the federal industry for a little over 13 years now, kind of showing my age. I've helped over 500 clients win more than 100 million in government contracts. While what I like to do is um, pre-solicitation engagement, I am a huge data nerd, so market research is definitely my jam. Great. Thanks, Ashley. And Jim, over to you. Thanks for joining us today. Great. Thank you very much for, for the introduction. Um, we got through the slides amazingly fast, so hopefully we can do the same thing. Um, yeah, thank you for everyone who joined us today. Uh, my name is Jim Sherwood. Um, over at Federal Compass, I've been in this market now for about 20 years, everything from doing market intel, data products, and to doing consulting. So um, I think much like Ashley, I'm a bit of a data nerd, as people might call me. So looking forward to hearing what everyone else has to say today as well. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. Okay. So as we said, uh, Jim and Ashley are covering market research, and I'm just going to move to this slide. I'll wait for you guys to tell me uh, when to move to the next slide. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. So market research should definitely be your first step to identifying not only your government customers, but also the prime contractors that um, have a vested interest in doing business with you. It's really critical for subs, especially as you're just entering the market, um, even if you're already an existing prime who might want to increase revenues and, and build some teaming relationships. So what the market research will tell you, and there are several sites that you can utilize to find this information. Uh, most of them source from the Federal Procurement Data System or FPDS.gov. Um, two that come to mind are USA Spending, which is my personal favorite, and then also the SAM ad hoc data reports. But the information is all coming from the same place. You can tell who's buying what you're selling at both the agency level and the prime contractor level. You can identify where you fit inside the market is maybe you provide a product or service that is a part of a whole. And there may not be a solicitation for exactly what it is that you do. You can leverage your set-asides. And when I say that, I don't mean by leading with them because you know you want to you want to present one voice and lead with your core competencies, but leveraging your set asides in a sense of you know targeting the prime contractors that may or may not have the same set asides as you that are already doing business is a great way to get your foot in the door. You can also expand your business through teaming relationships and joint ventures, and the market research is the first step to identifying who those are. Uh, there is a list of existing mentor-protege agreements on sba.gov uh, for their mentor-protege program. And definitely, I would recommend understanding the value of your past performance and kind of making an itemized list of the jobs that you performed, uh, whether that was for the federal government or for another corporate entity. Having logged things like start date, end date, uh, contract dollar amount, contract number, and most importantly, a results-focused description of what you brought to that uh, to that contract. Next slide, please. Great, thank you, Ashley. So, just wanted to cover market research um, and what most people think about it is is having dealt with a lot of companies, both small and large. A lot of small companies kind of think that market research is like this voodoo machine that only the large companies really need. Um, I would say that if you break out market research, you know, outside of the heavy data like FPDS into open source research, it's a really valuable tool to help you understand where your company sits in the mix of contractors that look a lot like you. Um, identity, whether you're a prime or a sub, is really important. And so going out and looking at other companies, looking at their capability statements, figuring out what you like, um, at the same time, do ones you don't like look a lot like yours? Um, are you saying that you do a thousand things? Are you a jack of all trade, but a master of none? That becomes really important when you're having those conversations with potential primes, you wanna have that elevator pitch down to a science and you really wanna be focused on what you do extremely well. So market research is, it doesn't have to be, you know, just what an agency is spending or just what's on a contract vehicle it can also be going out there to understand how do I want to present myself to the rest of the world 
by looking at companies that are similar to me, companies that I want to be like one day, um, and making sure I'm staying true to who we are as a company. Um, pursuing wins that build value and not revenue. Again, this is the idea of what Ashley talked about, understanding the customers that you want to go after. And so to build value towards pushing into that first prime, to build value than having some of your FTEs in the right place, meeting with the right program managers, what or what customers are buying a lot of what you're selling? Who, where are they located at? I want to get on contracts that get me there. I don't want to get on contracts that just give me revenue, but the people I'm meeting, it's not a long-term evolution for me. So I, I always see it as understanding your customers is one thing, but then understanding how am I going to get a foot in the door? How am I going to start having meaningful conversations? How am I going to become important to that customer, even though I'm a subcontractor? is really critical and you don't want just a hodgepodge of past performance. You want to be moving in the right direction. Um, a pipeline built on why and not how much or what is very similar to that. When you're looking at who you're going to be pursuing contracts with, you want to make sure that that aligns with what you found out before, right? How am I going to build, build value? Well, then that value statement needs to be what my pipeline actually looks like because even if it's not as much money as I'd like to be churning out right now, they, the experience and the exposure that I'm getting to those customers that I really want to grow into, that's the real why that I care about. Um, if I'm just building revenue, if I have a pipeline built on how much is in there, what is that going to do for me five, six, ten years down the road, right? That's usually when the pain points start to pop up when you start transitioning into a prime. Um, leveraging contract vehicles for those companies that are on the IT side, Nine out of every $10 now is going through a contract vehicle. So SAM.gov is great, but if you're on the IT services side, if you're professional services outside of facility support for DOE labs, um, about eight out of every $10 is going through contract vehicles there as well. So it's not so much figuring out who I wanted to go dance with. I need to make sure that the person I'm going to join actually has the information that I really need or the access that I need to get to those customers. Um, I don't want to chase after one opportunity. I want to chase after as many as I possibly can. Um, and if I have an in with a certain customer, that's a huge value add for me as a company. And I want to make sure I really leverage that. So I want to find those companies who are on contract vehicles um, for the IT companies. GWACs are great. It's using market research to say who's on this GWAC doing well, but has no exposure to a customer that I actually know. That's who I want to go work with. I don't want to work with, with, um, with CACI or, SA or SAIC, maybe they're the, they're the lead dog on those contract vehicles, but they don't need you. The companies that need you are the ones that aren't in that customer right now. So really understanding how you can take your own experiences, your own relationships, and look at the spectrum of contract vehicles that you want to chase after, um, whether that's one that exists right now, one that's going to be recompeted, you want, to cheat, you want to partner with those companies that would say, yes, I want your access because there's a lot of money there I can't access today. Um, so now you have a value to me that maybe other subs don't have. And that really leads into the idea of becoming that sub that primes really want to team with. And also kind of bleeds into the idea of, of not being the squeaky wheel partner. I think in a lot of prime sub relationships, the, the prime's gonna bring on as many people that they need to fulfill the, the capability gaps, to, 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 to fulfill the customer intimacy gaps. The one thing that they're not used to is someone coming to them with actual data of, I can bring you this pipeline right here. This is how much money I can bring to you because I know these guys over here and I know that they use this contract vehicle before. Here's 15 task orders that are gonna be recompeted on the next iteration of this contract vehicle, I can help you get in there. Because again, the primes, if they want to grow, they have to unseat an incumbent somewhere. And if they're on a contract vehicle, then they have to they have to unseat a smaller amount of incumbents, but they need every advantage that they can possibly get. So instead of joining a team and saying, hey, where's the money at? Where's the money at? The idea is, is becoming that irreplaceable partner who comes up and says, hey, here's a bunch of task orders. Here's the ceiling value on those. Here's when they're going to expire. Here's the contract vehicle they're on. Oh, by the way, you're on that now, or we're going to, or you're thinking about competing for that. I can be the person that helps you get that extra mile, get you inside that door, and now you're having those in-depth, um, beneficial conversations with that customer. 
and maybe together we're able to unseat one of those incumbents. That's a really valuable conversation. The less valuable conversation is, hey, can I join your team, right? And I don't have a good reason outside of here's my capability statement. Um, I think primes are constantly being, um, they're, they're, they're being solicited constantly by smaller businesses who want to be a sub. But in a lot of cases, there's not a lot of value there as to why they should make that decision. So if you can walk away with them saying, well, that was a really interesting conversation and I see the value in this company, suddenly they're a lot more interested in you. Um, and when you do get on jobs, right, now you're able to push those task orders back to them, right? You kind of set the hook, but now there's that idea of, if I want to get revenue, I've got to stay on my prime. I already talked about these task orders that could be coming up. Now I can really, really push on, hey, you know what, we're getting close to the recompete date here or the expiration date. What do you think about this? Um, just to make sure that that task order doesn't come and go. And because you're not seeing what the competitions are or what the RFPs are, because you're not a prime on that vehicle, they're alert to what it is that you want to actually be able to, to do. Is it always going to work? No. Um, but you have to find some way to have some leverage over your primes in order to make sure you're, you're getting revenue out of that out of that relationship and if they make revenue off that relationship then um you know obviously you're becoming more of a strategic subcontractor to them and they're going to want to they're going to want to exploit that customer intimacy you have in a lot of different ways um, again thinking of going back to the idea of pursuing you know what's important pursuing what has value that's also a really good way to look at this entire list getting down to exploiting your customer intimacy you want to have relationships in the places that are spending tons of money in, in what you do. You want to try to get boots on the ground, FTEs through, through the door, getting closer to that customer so that when the time comes for you to start advertising now, here's who I actually know, it is customers that are taking multiple pathways, use multiple different con um, contract vehicles. The harder it is for a prime to get their arms around that customer, the more valuable it becomes to have someone walk through the door that really has customer intimacy. So with that, Ashley, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you for the next slide. Thank you, Jim. There's a couple things that you said there that I'd like to piggyback on. And um, for those novice contractors that might be joining us today, um, you've heard a lot about the capability statement, right? And I will say that as you're you know, performing your market research, as you're planning on outreaching to potential primes that you wanna work with or potential teaming partners for that matter, it is appropriate to tailor your capability statement, incorporate that knowledge that you acquired from putting on your hat and kind of digging into the company, um, comparing energies might be where there are areas of opportunity and sort of regurgitating those in your past performance section and also your differentiator section of your capability statement. Um, it also becomes very important to tailor those to the agency and Jim mentioned the IT industry. I do personally work with a lot of IT clients and when they start Um, they hear a lot about the government's investment in areas like cybersecurity, IT services, but they're sitting on SAM and they don't see the solicitations. Well, um, the good thing about these contract vehicles is that in most, if not all cases, um, the incumbent information, contact information is available on the vehicle website. Uh, most of these prime contractors also have areas on their own websites to receive you. A lot of them will say, They become a supplier, become a subcontractor, team with us, and you know there will be a, an online form or an application style. Some of them are very long and tedious. Some of them are short and sweet. But the point is, is if there is a process that already exists, it's a great opportunity to demonstrate your level of responsibility and responsiveness immediately by following said process and then following up. Um, if you do uh, perform your market research and collect the intel that you need and you have a firm value proposition like Jim mentioned and you're ready to do the outreach um, have include a firm call to action 
And, you know, you always want to lead with what your core competencies are and the value that you bring to the table, not necessarily your set asides. You know, everybody can say that they're good at being a veteran owned small business or they're good at being a woman owned small business, but that's not really what you're good at. You're, you're good at the value that you provide and the services you provide. So do be sure to articulate those. Um, through that market research, you can identify gaps in the procurement strategies. I did work with one company who uh, was a subcontractor on one of the IT services GWACs and uh, the prime vendor, every time a task order would come through, the team would get an email, hey, can you do this? If somebody responded, they worked together and they developed the response to the solicitation. It's a great opportunity um, to attend you know, networking events, the 8A conference that's coming up, um, any industry specific or government events, um, whether it's online or in person. Now, granted, attending in person events does allow you that element of personal touch. And I've even had a client who ended up landing a contract uh, because of a conversation that was overheard by agency personnel sitting at the same table. Um, so do be sure to plan which events you want to attend and be sure to keep in mind that all the agreements and the conversations that you have with the prime contractors or the teaming partners, uh, the JV agreement, all that does have to be in place prior to any solicitation. If in your market research, you determine that a certain contract required a subcontracting plan, that's a uh, indicator that after the fact, if you are a named subcontractor, you know, you'll end up getting CPARS reviews and um, a lot of prime contractors will provide individual assessments, which can be used, obviously, to get your next job. So when you develop teaming agreements and joint venture agreements, it's kind of a trade off, right? Um, you're able to utilize the prime's resources. Maybe they have, you know, a very thorough proposal process and, and you don't. Maybe they have resources that they've already developed that you don't. Um, so you want to kind of outline exactly what each of you will be doing as part of the agreement and put that in writing before there is ever a solicitation. Um, I know, for example, the SOUP 5 is about to be recompeted. 2025, I believe. Um, they're, uh, the contractors that are targeting that contract are probably starting now, preparing their response. Um, I would also recommend follow those agencies on LinkedIn. I know a lot of business owners, you know, I don't have time for social media, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of great information that's being shared. And not to mention, if I went to, say, the Department of Defense LinkedIn page, I believe there's over 30,000 employees under the Department of Defense that are on LinkedIn. Now, there's nothing that says, you know, that you have to have a LinkedIn profile to do business with the government, but by and large, if you have a LinkedIn profile, you typically keep it updated. So it's a great way uh, to learn when people move around and shift in their roles, whether that's in the agency or the companies that you're targeting. Um, so do make sure to increase your market presence and, and uh, become a, a staple in your market and a reliable resource. You can also rely on your teaming partner's capabilities and their maturity. Like I mentioned, they may have um, developed systems and processes, uh, maybe even a color team, you know, that you may not have those resources, but you're able to team together and prepare the response. Um, cybersecurity is another area. Uh, not, uh, not all new contractors will even know what CMMC is, but if you happen to be performing work for the DOD, you have to be, in many cases, at least level one certified, if not level two. Most new contractors don't have that in place, but a teaming partner uh, can really, you can leverage your teaming partner to uh, help you get those things in order, fill out your NIST self-assessment and whatnot. Um, so even though there may not be a solicitation in your face for what it is that you do, don't discredit the power of relationships. In my experience, government contracting is more 80% relationships and 20% solicitations. And that might be giving solicitations a little bit of credit, especially if you're in one of those industries where contract vehicles um, are prevalent. I will say also, I've had a lot of companies coming to me talking about, I need a GSA schedule to do business with the government. Um, while that's possible, it may not be true. Once you register in SAM, you do start getting um, bombarded by third parties who, you know, want you to purchase their services. Well, here's the thing is the market research will help you answer all of those questions. And if you develop yourself a plan and identify the vehicles 
that there is spending for what it is that you do, a great first step uh, to getting on a GSA schedule would be to develop a teaming agreement or relationship with a company that already has a GSA schedule and set yourself up for future business. Um, the mentor protege programs, um, the SBA is just one who has a mentor protege, but once you have you know, performed a few jobs with your teaming partner and you know, the synergy exists, you guys are performing well together, it might open up the door for you know, sort of the next level and in entering into the mentor protege program. I know DOD has one, um, I believe, I know that the SBA has one and um, you know, you, there's not a limit. If you are part of the SBA's mentor protege program, you can still also be a part of the DOD's mentor protege program. Um, so definitely do your homework and uh, learn about those programs and kind of put them on your on your long term plan. Um, solicit excuse me, solicitations are just one way to win a contract. So um, make sure that if you are in a space, if you sell products that under $10,000 micro purchases are also an area of revenue for you. Uh, project managers have a P card or procurement card and contracting officers have a procurement card. So if you are in IT and your end user is more likely a program manager, um, keep in mind that reaching out to the agencies direct could also lead to you know, a great referral system. Uh, make sure that the industry liaisons in your targeted agencies have a copy of your capability statement on file and that you have broken the ice there uh, to inform them of what it is that you do. There's many times where, you know, performance, subcontractor performance is not up to par and, and a prime would really need to replace that subcontractor mid-contract. It happens all the time. Uh, oftentimes, the liaisons will be more than happy to pass on capability statements of companies that they know would be able to perform and, and provide similar services. So do be sure to increase your brand awareness by getting that marketing into the hands of the people that buy what you sell. And again, I will stop rambling, but it all does start with that market research. Yeah, Ashley, if you don't mind, I'm just going to piggyback on something you said. I think it's really important, and um, you didn't go exactly there, but um, from a market research standpoint, also understand those those primes that you're looking at. Um, not all primes are built the same. Um, if you end up on a contract vehicle, you want to know that you're on a contract vehicle with a prime that has the culture to succeed on a contract vehicle. Um, when you look at most of the large ones that that are out there, um, from you know Alliance Small Business going into Polaris on Alliance going into Alliance Two on all the GWACs, you know anything with you know, 20 or above awardees, it is the top 15% of those awardees that make up about 70% of all the spending. Um, so it doesn't leave a lot on the bone for everyone else. Um, and, you know, when you start talking about your COSB4, CSB4 SBs, you know, definitely a larger GWAC like Polaris, um, you're going to have a large list of companies that don't do a single dollar off there. You don't want to be married to a sub to a prime who doesn't have the right culture. So it's really important to go look at their previous performance on contract vehicles. It's going to tell you a lot. Um, you know, are they incentivized? Are the BD people incentivized to go chase after it? Do they, you know, does it appear like they have some sort of understanding of a GWAC center of excellence or a task order center of excellence or PMO internally? Um, you because again, you can go look at any one of these vehicles and you'll see the top 10 contractors are just killing it. And then very quickly, the, the you know, total obligations start to fall off drastically until you get to zeros. Um, and you just don't wanna be in that situation where you spend a bunch of time, got, re got really excited, and what's holding you back is a prime that isn't capable of actually pushing forward. So um, I would just be very careful about that. Just because someone approaches you doesn't mean it's the right partner. You wanna find the right partner that's, gonna, that's going to leverage what you can do um, but is also fully capable of succeeding in this market. Um, and it's not just going to whiff every single time that they go after something because then by proxy, you're kind of drowning in the same pool with them. And Jennifer, I think we're probably pretty good. There. I know we're a little bit ahead of time, but if you want to move forward, you certainly can, or we can opine a little bit more. I'll leave that up to you. Super. No, that was a great presentation. Really enjoyed what you both had to say and um, appreciate the time that you guys both took to put into the content and the slides. I know 
a lot of work goes into that behind the scenes with prep work and tech checks and all that. I know Ashley kind of faded out a little bit on the audio, but uh, um, I believe that we heard 99.9% .9 of uh, what you were saying. So again, thank you both. And I just want to make sure we've got our next panelist uh, ready to go here, which will be Tom Wilson and Jim Bender. And I believe I saw you both on the list here uh, as signed in. So Ashley and Jim Sherwood, thanks so much for your great insight. And again, the time that you took to mm -hmm present today, as well as all the, the work that goes into getting ready, uh, putting PowerPoints together and all that good stuff. Um, we will send out the slides. They are actually uploaded onto the slideshare.net site, and today's webinar is being recorded, so you're welcome to go over to YouTube, uh, I'd say within about 24 hours, and the entire webinar will be posted there. Um, so Ashley and Jim, I'll... Uh, Again, say thank you, and we're going to welcome up uh, Tan Wilson and Jim Bender, who are going to be covering strategies. We're kind of going through this chronologically as far as how a contractor would tackle uh, subcontracting. So obviously market research was first, and now we're going to talk about strategy. And let me just move on here to, again, Tan Wilson and Jim Bender. Uh, Tan, thanks so much for joining us. I know that you've i uh, been a presenter with us in other webinars in the past, and we're lucky to have you back today. So I'll let you take the floor and, and say what you need to say here. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, this is going to be a, a rapid fire type of presentation, but um, Tan Wilson here, president of Entelect. Uh We do BD capture, proposal support, business strategy. We are your business strategist um, for our efforts. Um, I'd like to say that, you know, we win SHIT here, so I'll keep it clean for the most part on this call, but really looking forward to speaking to you a little bit more um, about how to um, best subcontract um, the strategies behind all of that, um, which is what we do a lot with our customers. We help facilitate teaming um, and business strategy support for um, major recompetes or even to unseat the incumbents. So I'll hand it over to my uh, Co-presenter, Jim. Great, Jim Bender, uh, great to have you with us. You've presented uh, many times with us and I know you and I have done a couple joint presentations as well. So thanks for joining us today and I'll turn the floor over to you. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me to this uh, really uh, all-star team of presenters on uh, subcontracting. It's a very, a very important uh, part of becoming a successful contractor and maintaining your success. So I'm the principal of ZK Development Solutions. I've been doing this, uh, I've been an uh, independent consultant for about 10 years and uh, in the federal contracting space for considerably longer than that. Um, right now, as, uh, as a consultant, I work with uh, various sized companies from startups to mid-sized companies on the whole aspect of the business development capture and proposal management cycle. And uh, I'm uh, very excited to talk about the importance of uh, subcontracting. So let's jump right into the next slide uh, where we're gonna talk about strategies today. And this will be tag team. So first we wanna talk a little bit, um, in order to have a good strategy, you gotta have a reason to have partnerships. And uh, Tan and I just want to discuss uh, some of those, some of these reasons. Some of them may be obvious, maybe not so. Um, I have a good friend of mine. He's a retired uh, IT company executive. Uh, he sold out about 10 years ago to a big company. And his favorite saying was, your net worth is to, tied to the size of your network that if you're not doing a lot of networking, like most, as a leader in your company, if you're not spending a lot of time on networking and, and uh, teaming, um, you're not spending your time in the right place. Teaming gives you the opportunity to meet new people and learn more about new technologies or offerings, capabilities, and agencies that otherwise would be unknown to you. Government buyers like to encourage teaming because of they know the mixtures of capabilities and experience brings them a better solution. So they like to see well-formed and logical teams, and uh, it behooves you to spend time on making sure that you're doing that. So you're, you're, 
at the cutting edge of innovation and what, what you can provide uh, to your customers. Companies uh, often get asked to do things that are little or sometimes a great deal out of their core expertise area. And, you know, I've worked for big companies and I know that, hey, sure, I can figure out how to do this. I mean, I, I figured out how to do five other things and I can fake it till I make it. Uh, uh, find the right expert to put on as a consultant. But uh, really, uh, you're just allowing somebody to pay you to make mistakes and the government can often see through that. And why do you want to go through the risk? of trying to figure out something while you're under the pressure of deadlines and cost controls, when it's a whole lot easier to take on somebody to your team who, who, has, who, who is fully familiar with it and has already made the mistakes on somebody else's dime so that uh, they can perform to the highest uh, possibility. So if you, um, yeah, so there's a lot of risk in trying to fake it till you make it. Uh, we all, uh, indulge in it from time to time, but it's a lot better to expand your network. Secondly, you're going to fuel your business growth by tapping into new customers, capabilities, and contract vehicles. This was discussed in the last presentation a great deal. Um, I do a lot of market research for companies where I, I go through FBDS data and I tell them, okay, here's the fraction of your uh, your offering that's uh, open market like SAM or POs or uh, bilateral bilateral agreements, and here's where how much of it's going through vehicles. And a lot of times, I mean, IT, uh, you know, it's all getting sopped up by the big GWACs and the IT vehicles, whether they're agency specific or not. There's very little on the open market, but it's for other offerings. I'm working with somebody right now who does um, deaf services uh, like sign line, uh, signing and remote interpretation. And um, I'm finding that 80% of that is going through the GSA schedule, either as uh, delivery orders through GSA or through contracting mechanism that are competed on GSA. So fortunately, she's wor they're working with Jennifer to get on that schedule because that's where all the sales are happening. And if you're just depending on SAM, you're, you, you, they just won't see it because you'll never see the solicitations. Um, so learning about uh, new capabilities and customers expands your ability to take on different kinds of projects, uh, I, I, especially the smaller companies. I think well, I've noticed that the sign of a mature company is a tight capability statement. There are so many newbies that, you know, I did cybersecurity when I was in high school, so they put it on their capability savings. I'm only exaggerating a little bit. but uh, people will say that they can do janitorial services, uh, software development, and they also can do construction. And when people look at a capability statement like that, they say, well, what do you really do? What are you really good at? And it also makes it hard for you to be remembered. This, uh, so when you just focus on the things that you're really good at and the agencies that you're really good at and, and uh, take on teaming, team members to do that, you're going to have a much higher success rate. Um, so, and the reality is that you can only do a few things uh, um, unless you have a strong network of partners. If you've done the research that was talked about previously, you know how your service offering is being purchased and how it's bundled together with other offerings. And you'll know how to, um, you'll have a roadmap for the ty type of partners that you want to pursue. Uh, as has been stated already, having visibility in a contract vehicles is critical to knowing how your service is purchased and what the, uh, what the government values in its purchase decisions. So um, making sure you have a vehicle strategy is very important. Finally, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about uh, risk. Uh, taking on a big requirement all by yourself. Uh, has a lot of risk involved. There's a lot of investment for BD and proposal work that uh, maybe you don't want to take on uh, by yourself. Uh, so the best teaming relations is have clear re reasons for being and well-defined swim lanes for each partner. And uh, these strong teaming relations are to make full use of the resources, skills, and past performance of each teaming partner. 
So through many, you become one, uh, one offerer to the government. Good teaming partners yield the scope that they can probably do to the stronger partner who can do it best. Winning teams are formed after an honest and transparent discussion of each member's strengths and weaknesses and have a joint discussion of the requirements of the opportunity they are pursuing to create the best uh, team and the best arrangement of resources across the teams uh, to, to offer to the government. And uh, I'll turn it over to Tan now to uh, talk about filling performance and experience gaps. Great, thanks, Jim. So this is Tan again. Um, I just wanted to kind of pull the thread a little bit um, regarding the performance and experience gaps. So, you know, as, as we've talked multiple times here, um, one of the strategies for that is is definitely to, to fill in some gaps. And I think this is incredibly critical for some of the scorecards and larger bid type of efforts, right? So um, I'll say the, uh, the much dreaded B word, you know, like when you see large opportunities that are being bundled, um, smaller contracts that are being consolidated, um, there's there's a lot of an, um, competitive um, um, landscape for who's going to be bidding on these opportunities. And so um, actually, Jennifer, I think the slides advanced here. We need to go back to the first one. Um, so, you know, for uh, for these types of larger bundled and scorecards opportunities, sometimes um, teaming either in a prime sub relationship or a joint venture or a mentor protege relationship, which will be discussed here later on in this session, um, that teaming construct will really help kind of define um, how and which opportunities you're going to be bidding on, right? So um, with that said, though, you know, you, there is some level of competition that you do want to take off the street. So a teaming strategy that I like to use a lot is, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. Um, and the largest do this really well. You'll see the large SIs, you know, prime one, they'll sub to that prime on another. Um, and then in the next bid, they'll, they'll flip the relationship. So, um, and, and a lot of the smalls do this really well too. Those that have developed very strategic teaming relationships instead of teaming for convenience. And so a lot of times I like to kind of um, discuss teaming um, as terms of like a relationship, right? So I have a presentation on Tinder teaming, right? In this age, do you swipe left or do you swipe right on a team member? Um, and again, it all kind of depends, but at the same time, it's kind of a catch-22 um, when you team, because when you team, you are sharing some incredibly, you know, um, intimate type of information, knowledge, insights, um, so not only can you gain insights from your teaming partner on either a program, a customer, um, whatever it might be from other members, you're also expected to kind of convey your insights too, to help increase your probability of winning on, on that effort. So um, maintaining, you know, that uh, separation and you know what do we share what don't we share is, is really kind of a, an ongoing challenge to teaming so I, I think we've talked a lot about you know the great sides of teaming but there is a really you know um, a, a cautious side to teaming that you really do have to be careful with um, regarding the who you choose and um, you know who participates on your team and really how much information you do share with them um, but in all practical matters, though, when it comes down to it, you're able to really bid on a much larger number of opportunities um, and be able to expose to a number of other customers that maybe you as a lone bidder would not be able to, um, to capitalize on. So, you know, even large businesses don't have an unlimited amount of BMP funds. Um, Small and mid-tier companies have even more limited um, types of funds to go after a number of bids. So um, teaming allows you to do more with less um, besides, uh, you know, all the other obvious things that we've discussed, which is, you know, lowering your, um, your, your uh, risk in, in the process. So with that, um, we'll go on to like the common pitfalls which I think everyone needs to be kind of concerned with. Some of these are, you know, um, obvious, and some of them um, are things that you may not have 
consider it. So Jim, you want to take it? Thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, I've been in federal contracting for uh, more than 25 years, and I've had more teams than I can uh, care to count. And rarely have I worked one with in a team where one of the partners is outright dishonest. But uh, we all practice the art of stretching the truth uh, or uh, making us, uh, some past performance sound a little bit more than what it, what it actually was. So this is why, you know, especially when you're with a new uh, teammate, you want things to go well. Uh, but somebody needs to be asking the hard questions about, well, what did you really do? Otherwise, um, otherwise you're going to run into problems with the review team and everybody's going to lose. Uh, uh, more uh, So uh, you want to be ready to accept that somebody is being honest, but confirm that you understand what honesty is about. So extensive experience is a term of art that's very flexible. So what does that exactly mean? How many people were on the job? How many years have you been doing it with what agencies? Uh, if uh, they say they are very familiar with a certain process or technology, have them um, explain um, have them ex explain it in a way that you can understand that sounds convincing. Um, for instance, uh, people, everybody who's in IT that does websites will say they do 508 compliance. Well, so what is your process for doing 508 compliance? And is that process externally verified or certified? Um, and what is your quality control process for that? Uh, then compare what they tell you with what you can find out from somebody who's an expert in the field or from publicly available uh, uh, resources that can be trusted to know the uh, know how the process should work. And I'll say this about it. I recently had somebody uh, who had a subcontractor that they were counting on for an important past performance. Um, and I told her, well, um, they're going to be checking their CPARs, so you better demand to look at them. And once you're under a, a teaming agreement situation, and if the CPARs of a, your teammate is critical. It's reasonable, especially if you're the prime contract, it's reasonable to ask to look at that to just make sure what they're saying is true. And other ways that you can check up on our company are just a simple Google search to see or a search to see if there's any pending judgments against them, um, either financial or um, uh, or financial or um, uh, or contract defaults or anything like that. Um, so um, uh, next I want to talk about the ability to clearly articulate your company's key differentiators. I am mystified at how many clients when I ask them, okay, well, what makes you different? I can't get a coherent answer. Now, there's, there's a lot to be said for relationships and uh, being able to create an air of trust around you, but when it comes down to it, you got to be able to explain to me in an elevator pitch why I want to buy from you for somebody that's than somebody else. Um, yes, sometimes it can be abstract, but you need to have like here are the five points why my company is so great. Is it uh, we are fast? Is it we are meticulous? Is it because we are cheap? I've got a client right now who just came right out and told me I've seen the prices of my competitors and I can undercut them by twenty percent. I said sweet. I know how we're going to win business here um, uh, because price is always an, an issue. Um, so there's going to be a competitive uh, procurement with a written submission. The team will have to be able to explain why they're superior, why they are best choice among competing authors. And this, of course, is a team effort. So it's a co combination of, of all your competitive offerings. And through market research and through your discussions with government agency personnel, competitors, and teammates, you should know how you compare with the other people in your space. And you should know how the client defines what good is, because it may not be the way you do and speak their language about it. So, uh, so uh, one thing, it's, it's easy to get together with teammates go to a proposal outline and say, okay, here are the three reasons we're going to 
win. But it's more, it, it's worth the time to really think it through, to look dispassionately at all the evidence you have in the written RFP, as well as uh, intel that you've gathered from public sources or from relationships, to really think about, well, who are the people we're stacking up against? And uh, how are we going to clearly explain to the client we're better than them? So uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Tan to talk about the next bullet point. So let's be a little practical about this, right? So let's take it down to the tactical level with the teaming partners' um, qualifications capabilities. So um, I'm truly the hugest advocate for trust but verify. I trust no one and I verify everything. Um, because, you know, a lot of times the initial teaming discussions are done at the BD level, right? Again, not that I don't trust BD professionals, but they're there to sell. And so they're selling the good side to their abilities. Sometimes they're stretching the good sides of their abilities. So, you know, a really good BD capture um, professional is going to know how to map the qualifications and the requirements against each of the opportunities. And so, you know, this is why, you know, my, my, my biggest thing is I think the capture um, professionals are, uh, the one people who are really not appreciated and you can see a good capture professional by the quality of vetting that they've done on an opportunity um, to determine whether or not they do have the past performance and the abilities and so you'd be surprised when you look at a capabilities matrix and you're doing your gate review how often you're finding holes or blowing holes through some of those requirements and some of those abilities because they just are not clearly documented so um, you need to be able to kind of document the prerequisite ex experience and, and, and meet at least a minimum set of requirements before you can even determine, you know, why your team, why are you going to beat the incumbent or why are you going to beat the, um, you know, the, the other competitors out there. Um, with that said, though, you really need to kind of determine what are you going to be your deal breakers, right? You can't team with everybody. Not everyone you're going to bet you're going to team with. And that's that's OK. Right. You know, like you need to kind of know whether or not you're going to go on that second date. So like we've had drinks, we've kind of danced around a little bit. And now it's coming down to, you know, do I really want to bring you home and introduce you to the parents? Um, and so what are your deal breakers? And there's so many different deal breakers that could be out there. It needs to be determined, you know, predominantly on do they bring value? to your bid, to your team? Are you just teaming for convenience? Are you teaming because you just need a big name on the contract, um, uh, on your proposal? And, and that's okay too, right? So sometimes you name drop, sometimes you need to have that one team member in order for you to have street cred with the customer. Um, and so that might be a strategy for, for that, but you know, if they're not bringing any value and if you don't see the reason for it, then they shouldn't be part of your team, at least not for that opportunity. Um, the other thing, too, is organizationally speaking, uh, they need to align with your organization. Do they fit? Um, do both of you fit together? You know, can you work together cooperatively? Do you present a united front? Um, is there a uneven relationship um, where one seems to overpower the other? Um, and, and this is really especially important for you to evaluate and consider, especially if you're a small business and you're teaming with another business who is maybe a lot more mature, either a larger business, you know, sometimes larger and, and more experienced companies will come in and try to kind of take over um, and, and you're the small business prime. So you need to kind of assert yourself and know where to draw that line in the sand and then kind of set that precedence and that those, those terms and that cadence early um, in the relationship, otherwise, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of a, a precursor to potential risk and potential challenges and obstacles that you're going to be facing down the line on the execution side. So, you know, like, like that last, uh, second to last bullet about poor performing team members, um, I evaluate this and you can see a lot of this at the very onset of when you team, right? So you team initially for a specific opportunity. In that proposal process, you can tell a lot about a potential teaming member and how they're going to 
um, you know, how they're going to operate uh, post award. And so if you've got a team member who is always late, is unresponsive, is dismissive, is rude, um, it, it, that just does not reflect and present themselves well or in a professional manner, you may want to think twice about that. And I've kicked off several subcontractors on my bid teams for that performance issue. And I've advised my client, I don't care what you think, this is a red flag and you need to cut. You need to cut them now, otherwise it, it's going to be a train wreck and it's going to impact your performance on your contract, which will impact your reputation with the customer and potentially impact your CPARs and your performance ratings. And so winning the contract is one thing, properly and better performing on the contracts is another. Um, and so, you know, you need to kind of know and, and kind of read the tea leaves a little bit early in the relationship as to whether or not that's going to be, you know, an impact or an area of concern. And on the last point, because I know that we're running tight here and we want to move to some key takeaways, is that waiting too late, right? Um, I get questions a lot about when should we team or, you know, I, I get a call and we're starting a bid and they're still finalizing teaming and they're still figuring out where their gap assessments are. Um, sometimes teaming too late uh, is, you know, that's never a good recipe for success. And so, like other of my colleagues have mentioned before, you can never begin the discussions on teaming too early. Um, I think some of the best teams that are that are out there are done without an opportunity, that are done in a very organic um, way that is not a transaction. Um, and so the strategic longer term type of courting, you're dating for a longer period of time, you're getting to know each other, you're developing a cadence and a rapport, those tend to work really well. Um, and so, you know, sometimes post-award teaming does work, a lot of times it doesn't and it will cause you to lose time in your response and you will struggle um, and you, it is going to be very transparent in your final work product. So with that I think we'll move on to um, our last slide which are um, our common key takeaways and advice to strategic teaming. Jim? Yeah, nothing, uh, nothing could be more important in teaming than doing your homework and getting out in front of opportunities because as Tan just said, um, it, time, time is everything. Time is really underrated in calculating this mystical P-win uh, that we talk about. Uh, because if, if you're just getting in late to the game, um, the, the winning teams are already formed. Um, because the, the people who are, who are mo most likely positioned to win something are the ones who have been thinking about it for a long time and have done their homework. They've been watching for the, the contract that's expiring. They've been watching the pre-solicitation notices and they jump on it then because it's a priority for them and they're committing their resources because they know they can win. Um, there's just a great deal of public information out there to help you to respond to insoli any solicitation. We've talked about the, the tons of data on FBDS. I'm, I'm really surprised at how easy it is to find out uh, information about incumbent contractors, uh, an incumbent contractor is not eligible to bid, boy, that's always a red flag. And don't you love to see that when they've sized out of the category and now it's up for recompete and at best they're going to be a subcontractor that, uh, or if, if it's put on a vehicle that they're not on, you say, wow, why did the government do that? There must be some problem there and they don't want them to bid on it. That's fairly rare, but it does happen once in a while. Um, uh, they uh, make, make use of the SBA uh, small business database. They will tell you what the contractors are asserting to the small business administration about their size and if they're large or small in a given uh, NAICS code. Um, and uh, you can al also always find a lot of teaming partner information by looking for similar requirements in the same agency that have been awarded uh, through the FBDS data. Um, it's important to believe in your company. It's important to be gung-ho uh, about your chances, but it's also important to have a fish eye once in a while, to, have, to look sideways at something and say, you know, we really think this could happen, but 
Uh, are we going to be able to convince the government of that? You have to be, um, uh, you, you have to pull out all the stops you, and you have to motivate your team and you have to explain them, yeah, we're going to win this uh, in order to get them to do their all. Uh, but have you thought about doing, um, if, if you uh, are concerned about your internal team having the objectivity, if you thought about bringing in an outside expert, a so-called black hat review, we bring in an outsider to look at your strategy and see if it passes a laugh test. Um, uh, and remember, you might have a great offer, but are you going to be the best offer that can beat out the known competition? And uh, I know we're running out of time, and I don't want to chew up uh, my partner's last little bit, but do be willing to work, start out small and work your way up the value ladder when selling a new offering or entering a customer space, because um, realistically, nobody's going to give you the chance to work on a big one until you've established yourself. Tom, talk about uh, right. teaming is not a sign of weakness. Yep, no, and, and exactly. So, you know, a lot of people want to prime. Um, I hear it all the time, but, you know, priming is, and, and teaming is not a sign of weakness, whether or not you're a sub um, on it. It doesn't make your team weaker because you bring on other subcontractors. And in, in some regards and some opportunities, it's required, it's requested, and the customer is actually looking for it. So really kind of read the tea leaves and the opportunities because, you know, teaming on some opportunities is, could be, and one of your win themes um, for that. So, um, but again, you know, like 49% of something is better than 0% of anything. So again, you do what you need to do to get on the team and to win, you know, new work. Um, but do it when it really makes sense though, right? And so be very deliberate in your teaming decisions um, because it may not be the best either for you or that situation at that time. Um, and to close it out though, is to always kind of be wary, protect yourselves, um, protect yourselves on the opportunities. Uh, you know, I'm a huge advocate of being very clear on work share, be very clear of your swim zones, especially if it's a large team. Really fight for your own best interest and for your percentage and part of it. And if you do fight and you say that you're able to provide and you're going to support it, then show up, right? Show up for everything. Show up for calls, show up for data calls, be responsive, um, because we all like to team with the last person that we spoke with. And so, uh, you know, don't always go to someone or email someone or tag them on LinkedIn or something because you want something from them. Do it because if it helps them, it's going to help you. And people remember um, people who help them uh, either accomplish something um, or provide information or intel without being asked for it. So share, be deliberate. Um, and always be proactive in, in your approach to teaming. And I think, you know, what goes around comes around. And so the, the universe will give back what you put out there. Uh, and so I, I think with that, Jennifer, that pretty much concludes our discussions on strategies for teaming. Tan and Jim, that was awesome. I loved it. And uh, you guys uh, finished right on time. So even better. Uh, it was great content. Uh, very lively and um, you guys hit on some excellent points so thank you again for the time that you took to put together the slides all the prep work that goes into this the rehearsals and uh, and just uh, making that timing exact um, but thank you both and thanks to everybody who has uh, joined us today for this complimentary webinar it is being recorded give us about 24 hours it will be up on our YouTube channel if you subscribe to the YouTube channel which doesn't cost you anything you'll get an alert when this is uploaded uh, the slides have already been uploaded to the slideshare.net site, uh, and that's also a complimentary uh, download. Uh, next up, we're going to talk more about business development as we kind of go through this chronologically. Uh, we have Mark Amtower and Chelsea Maggot with us, who I believe are both uh, logged in and ready to rock and roll. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to Chelsea. And thanks, Chelsea, for joining us today. I'll let you uh, say what you need to say here. Hi all, thanks everyone so much for tuning in. My name is Chelsea Maggot. I'm CEO of Collaborative Compositions. 
we help small businesses mainly uh, work with the federal government, so navigating those tough contracting waters and understanding subcontracting. So looking forward to presenting with Mr. Mark Amtower. Awesome. Thanks, Chelsea. And Mark, always great to have you with us. Uh, I'll be quiet and let you say what, uh, whatever you want to here. Uh, Jennifer, thank you very much. Sorry if my voice is a little raspy today. I'm getting over COVID and a cold, <clears throat> but I have energy, so there we are. I advise companies on all aspects of marketing to the government, but I focus on building subject matter expert platforms, leveraging content, and using LinkedIn and social selling techniques. So uh, I've been doing this uh, for a few weeks. I started my company in January of 1985. So I've been around, seen a few things, and I try, try to stay on the edge of what works. So that's it. Let's uh, let's roll. Okay, let's rock and roll. I'm going to put myself on mute and let you guys uh, dig in. Just let me know whenever you're ready for your next slide. So what we're going to cover is finding the right contract, first of all, what you bring to the party, how to do research, how to research the prime, uh, what do you do during your SBLO meeting if you're going to do an SBLO meeting, and why LinkedIn is a key element in this entire process. Chels, up to you. Thank you very much, sir. Next slide. So, as you can see here, we've got these amazing research tools. And if you've not tuned in earlier, you need to be proactive when you're looking to subcontract, especially because a prime is probably not going to spontaneously come knocking on your door. So, to start with the upper hand and maintain it, you want to start with the work that you want to be doing. Use tools like USA Spending, SAM, FPDS to identify the contracts that your target agencies that expire in the next 12 months, 12 to 24 months. Now, 12 months is being pretty generous because large contracts are planned for well ahead of time. So you need to give yourself a ton of adequate runway to pursue government work, especially subcontracting work because teams are formed early. Take a look at the contract performance. So once you have dug in and seen a couple of contracts that are under your agency that expire within that time frame, take a look at the performance. Has there been an increase in value over the previous cycles? Has there been a growing ceiling or a growing scope? You can get all of that information on these tools and it's all publicly available. Has there been any de-obligations? Is the contract shrinking? That's really helpful information to know. Don't go after contracts that are, are typically losing scope, losing funding, losing ceiling. Once you identify a growing contract opportunity, you want to seek to identify and document who the incumbents on that opportunity, on that contract are. So who are the primes? In the case of multi-year contracts, you want to look through the historical awards to identify who's held the contract previously and who holds it now. Has it changed hands several times? Has there been uh, the same incumbent over and over? It's that's going to give you some sense that they are probably liked by the government customer. If you start early and you're not finding the information that you're trying to find, this is why I said that 12 to 24 months, you can submit FOIA request or Freedom Inf Information Act request to get some of the information on some of these scopes of some of the contracts that you're trying to find. In some cases, you can get uh, interested vendors lists as well. So that's really helpful information to find out who's expressed interest in, in that contract previously. And if you can't find that information, just try to do a basic Google search. I mean, oftentimes, if you're finding bits and pieces, you can find enough to kind of tie it together. And don't be afraid to reach out to even the government customer. I mean, you really wanna have a good sense for what the scope of that contract is. And if you know, you're not finding the information you need, don't be afraid to reach out and ask for it. Also, don't be you know, discouraged from looking in, into the subcontracting directory for small businesses to find large prime contractors and federal contracts. Um, you can ask contractors and you can contact contractors that may need your services and identify whether they've got you know, contracts that have uh, some scope that you're probably going to be interested in. After you do this research, you are, should have a strong list of prime contractors 
that either hold contracts in your agency of interest or have expressed interest in holding contracts with your agency of interest. Next slide. Now that you have identified the work that you want to do, and before you go and talk to anybody, you really want to be clear on what you're bringing to the relationship. Beyond knowing that there is work on the contract that you're interested in or that they have, you know, opportunities that you might be able to capture, you really want to be able to convince the prime that you're a critical part of their team that's been missing or that their government customer is going to love you being added. Never lead with your set aside, as has mentioned earlier. Take stock of your true value, like what your company actually offers. Know what your strengths are and be ready to explain them. If you don't know why a contractor should give you work, then you probably won't be able to convince them to do so. So if you've got a deeper knowledge of the tool than your competitor, or maybe you know the agency's goals better than the competitor or how to accomplish them better, do you have a skill set or IP that can add leverage to the competition's bid? Maybe you have an existing footprint in the agency or an office location near the contract place of performance. You might have a technology or a niche skill set that could add some value to an incumbent's offering. Now, if you want to identify, you know, technologies or skill sets that the prime predicts to be promising, you can do that by reviewing their business reports, specifically look through like the management discussion and analysis and business sections of these prime contractors. Remember, a lot of these are large businesses that have shareholders and most of them have reports that are, are pub publicly available. Look for technical terms used to describe technologies that appear in this year's report, but not last year's report. And find the ones that are in present tense or future tense, not the ones that are in past tense. So identifying things that you think your prime is probably going to like and, and value is just absolutely clearly highlight your strengths in all of your opportunity specific marketing material. Start to develop like capability statements that speak to exactly what you're trying to target with that prime and what you think they value. And really gonna say it again, don't fall back on your set aside status. It's it really doesn't add any value when you say, I'm an 8A and I do this, this, and this. People kind of stop right there because they're like, you're leading with that. And now, you know, what, what are your strengths? Put those forward, put your best foot forward. Next slide. Now that you think that you understand what's most important to the prospective prime partner, you need to rationalize what really matters to them because it's gonna be different. Although you probably think that you have a sense as to what sort of compliance requirements and, and what sort of work they're doing, you really need to have a better sense of what is actually important to them rather than what you're proud of and what you think matters. So they pri the primes are facing more compliance requirements than essentially ever before, and they are responsible for their small businesses and their supply chains. So the bigger the supply chain, the harder it becomes to manage. That can be essentially an opportunity for you. If you're a trusted partner, if you are a trusted partner within their supply chain, and then you can take on more work, you can take out some of those layers and ideally shrink their pool of vendors that they have to manage. That can be seriously advantageous to them. If their main focus is being compliant, yours should be gaining a deep understanding of what their compliance requirements are. You can get a sense by looking at the contract clauses and ideally you've got the contract from the FOIA request earlier. Um, you can get a good sense by looking at, at some of the agency requirements. Oftentimes you're, you're gonna face much stricter requirements in DOD as was mentioned earlier than you would in, in FedCiv for instance. Uh, this is one area, for instance, where if you've got a, a penchant for cybersecurity, that that can add some substantial value. So if you are CMMC compliant, you can offer, offer that as an added level of trust. And if you can assure them that you'll help them maintain compliance throughout the lifetime of the contract, now you really have their attention. That's something that, that turns heads and is definitely a, a prime focus of the primes these days. They're also really price conscious. 
So if you've got favorable relationships with resellers or providers, make sure to highlight that. They want to know that you can get, you know, the, the friends and family discount from, from IBM. Throw that out there. And even if you've got like the flexibility to relocate or if you, you've got key personnel that, that the government might like or they might have come out of government, those are all really, really attractive. And if you want to find gaps that they might have, you can really check their career page to look and see how many open positions that they have available and, and look and see what those titles are. You can get a good sense for if they've got several jobs in one area, they might have gotten a contract there. They might have multiple positions to fill and, and you can kind of go and have a conversation with them about being able to cover more positions than, you know, they have a need for. That offers quite a bit in terms of subcontract value and bringing something to the table that they care about is quite important. Um, next slide. So now that you've gotten awareness of the opportunities and the primes and you know you figured out what matters to them and what you think matters to them, you really want to do some research and find out which ones that you really want to approach. This is where that social research often comes in. You want to make sure that your corporate visions align. You know, if, if they're trying to be the biggest health IT provider and you're really trying to go into cybersecurity compliance, you know, there's, there's alignment, but not direct alignment. You kind of want to make sure that you've got a good sense and a good feel for what that company culture is, what their values are, and where they want to go so you can align with them to be a, a long-term partner. That's what they want. Uh, do some basic research. I always say just Google them. Is it positive, the stuff that comes up, or is it negative? I mean, have they had several poor reviews lately, or are they in a good light and making money? Um, do they have a positive reputation score on Glassdoor? What their employees say about them, that that really matters. I mean, if somebody hates working there, what is it going to be like to subcontract for them? I mean, although employees can sometimes be, you know, resentful or however, if they've got a high amount of turnover, what does that mean for their subcontract? Or pool. It's very possible that they may have some overlap there that they may not be willing to, uh, to, to take on. So you want to also see how big are their subcontracts and how old are their subcontractor relationships. You know, you can, I have had conversations with some primes that haven't turned over any subcontractors in the last 35 years. They probably don't have the freshest technology, but boy, they trust their pool. So Get a good sense for you know if they've got lifetime value relationships and if those are increasing you know if some of these primes are shrinking their subcontractor pools uh and if the businesses that they've been working with are going under then that's probably not a good sign that they're uh, you know an equitable partner to work with most large primes know that they have a substantial amount of resources and assets at their disposal so they feel like they're superheroes don't don't come to the table don't come to the conversation with a superhero offer come with a kick-ass sidekick offer be their supporting staff and be there to support them in terms of what they need to get their job done and please their government customer um really honestly you just want to make sure that you're bringing complementary skills and talent and be confident in being a team player you know, go after things that are, are of a reasonable size. Don't walk in there with, you know, small past performance values and ask for, you know, $5 million in, in contract value right off the bat. You know, be reasonable and, and have reasonable expectations. Go to the table with, you know, the knowledge in hand and, and you're definitely going to get ahead. Next. Uh, Lee, go back to the previous slide for a second. I want to touch on the uh, GovCon media thing. This is incredibly important across the board. There are <clears throat> our traditional players, GovExec, Federal Computer Week, Government Computer News, WashTech, et cetera, but there are a number of other players in the market now, some legitimate news, some people magazine-y, but a lot of them play significant roles here, especially significant roles in understanding 
who those primes are, what motivates them. You know, don't don't omit podcasts from this too. Uh, Joyce Bosk of Bosco Bell Marketing uh, publishes a top GovCon podcast list every year. I have I've been on the radio slash podcast for 17 years now uh, at Federal News Radio, Federal News Network. Uh, there's a lot of other shows there that are excellent, but there's a lot of really good information. If, uh, you know, if you need information on companies, going to those podcasts and searching for information on those companies is a great way to get kind of an inside scoop and to understand who some of the key players are that you may not otherwise find at those primes. Now let's go to the next slide, please. So. <clears throat> if you're lucky enough to meet with a PM, the same would apply, but your likely point of entry is going to be an SBLO, a small business liaison officer. And the biggest issue SBLOs and OSDBUs have, for that matter, is that a company will come in talking about themselves, their set aside status, uh, you know, the me, 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 I, I, I did this. That's not what they want to hear, okay? You, you, have, uh, you have a gateway to meet the right people in a prime if you're meeting with an SBLO. So your questions and the information you provide have to be dead on target. So all of the, the presentations prior to this should have loaded you up with a lot of information, a lot of research that you can use in that meeting with an SBLO. Do not assume it's going to be a long meeting. If you get 15 minutes uh, and it's extended, God bless you, uh, but 15 minutes may be about it. So cue up the information that's most germane. Uh, you know, where go again, back to where you fit. What is your area of expertise? What do you know about the contract? What do you know about the customer? Fit these things in first. And don't even touch on your set-aside status until you're asked. Not difficult. So understanding the motivations of the Prime, understanding how long the Prime's had the vehicle, or if they're new to the vehicle, if they're just bidding for the first time, you know, then you really have to emphasize the value that you bring to the table, including not just your expertise, but as Chelsea and others have mentioned, you know, do you have a footprint? Do you have a beachhead at that agency? Do you know any of the the tech staff? Do you know the contracting people? Do they know you? That's the most important part of that equation. Do they know you? And this is all stuff that you can take care of prior to meeting with the SBLO. So during the meeting, you have to display a knowledge of the prime, the contract, uh, share any and all knowledge, any and all knowledge you have of the contract or the contracting agency. Uh, you want to share as much as possible then because you're laying yourself on the line to get a piece of this business. You're opening your kimono wider than you would normally. But you have to recap all of this in a very short period of time and be prepared to give an overview of where your company fits, what you bring to the table and why you are an integral part of the uh, of the win scenario. Next slide, please. If you guys have seen me speak before or read anything that I've written, you'll know that I'm addicted to LinkedIn and it's my favorite sandbox in the uh, in the government market. Everything you do publicly, including LinkedIn, is marketing. So presenting yourself here is presenting yourself not only to the 2.72 million feds who are on LinkedIn, but every friggin' contractor out there, okay? Every, I know there's 2.72 million feds on LinkedIn because every year I do a census of how many feds are there. And I do it by researching every nook and cranny I can find. So. This year, I identified 556 company pages on LinkedIn that represent federal agencies, departments, operating divisions, even down to the office level. So I can find virtually anybody I need to on the federal side on LinkedIn. 
And if the feds are here, you know the contractors are here, okay? So think of it this way. This, this is the, the place where absolutely everybody is vetted. If you, if you do not have a viable, informative, robust presence on LinkedIn, you're meeting with an SBLO, a program manager, or anybody else at the prime is going to go south in a hurry because if they don't know you personally, they're going to vet you here. They'll vet you here before they vet you on your website. Okay. So your profiles have to be extremely robust. If you're claiming an area of expertise, you have to document that, substantiate that on LinkedIn, not simply by claiming the spot, by but by producing and presenting enough content through your profile, individual profiles and company profiles. If you have legitimate subject matter experts in the areas where you're trying to get the work, make sure their profiles are full, make sure their profiles are robust and informative and have current content to support and document their, their, uh, their positions in the market. Anybody can claim to be a SME. Anybody can claim to be a thought leader. We've all seen this before, but the credibility of that is established by what you're sharing on a regular basis through LinkedIn. And it doesn't have to be original material. It can be other people's content. So if you see, if you're in zero trust and you see something out there from, uh, from Ron Ross at NIST or anybody else who's not writing about a competitor. If it's good content, you share it, you add your two cents to it, and you're displaying uh, you know, your knowledge of, of that particular niche. But you need the visibility, the credibility, and you need to build the audience and the influence. And LinkedIn is the ideal place to do this. So it's the ideal place to, to start, you know, go back to do you have a beachhead in the client agency? Well, if you're not trying to build out a beachhead before you go to the contractor, then you're, you're falling behind anyway. You can find the contracting officers. You can find the internal program managers. You can find the people that you think might be influencing the direction of the contract. All of these things you can do on LinkedIn if you bother to learn how to use the platform. But ignoring LinkedIn and the subcontracting process is going to put you behind your competitors and put you closer to a losing position. So um, there, there's just, you know, you can do account-based marketing. You can build that subject matter expert platforms. You can share content. You can comment on other people's content. But basically, we're here to network. It's a social network. So building out your connections in the area that you work on both sides of the equation, the government side and industry side. A lot of people don't think that Govies connect. That is not accurate. A lot of people don't connect, period. So government may fall into that part too. But if you give them a reason for you reaching out to connect, if you put it in context that you have done work, want to do work with their agency, and this is your area of expertise, and these are the contracts that you're looking at, they're more likely to accept. So not, not leveraging LinkedIn here is, is the kiss of death. Your company profile has to be a link back to your corporate website, but it also has to be informationally robust. So if you're a division of a larger company in the federal division, you can create a sub page. But if you're a small contractor and you're focused on government, you have two opportunities. You have the individual profiles and you have the company profile. So leverage both, leverage it well. Um, one other tip here, the background area behind your headshot, about 75% plus of that area on LinkedIn is blank on most people's profile. That is the biggest billboard that is free on LinkedIn. That's editable space and you can fill it in with any kind of information. And I would suggest that you consider doing it 
in a way that emphasizes your area of expertise. Okay, that way when somebody goes to your profile, boom, it's right there in front of them. So Jennifer, I think we're going to finish early and I thank you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Mark and Chelsea. That was a great presentation, lots of good points. And uh, I second all of your points in regards to social media and LinkedIn and just the power of networking and relationships. So thank you both uh, so much. Any last uh, thoughts from either of you, Chelsea or Mark? I'll, I'll go, Jen, we, we've known each other for probably longer than either of us will admit. And your activity on LinkedIn is exemplary. People should emulate what you've been doing for the last 15 years or so on LinkedIn. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it and, uh, and back at you. Uh, it's great to and have I'll you on the program today. I'll chime in here and, and say similar concept, you know, Jen, you're, your activities, your events are amazing, and you do so many awesome agency-specific and contractor-specific events. Those are absolutely informative and really helpful for small businesses and, and subcontractors, so definitely tune into those. Great, and back at you, Chelsea, you and, you and Mark, again, have great content, as do uh, all of the rock star speakers that we've got today, so I appreciate you guys taking the time to put together the content sharing your ideas and thoughts, uh, which are obviously very valuable. And thanks again to all of the attendees um, who have joined us today. If, you're, if you need to hop off for any reason, we are recording the entire webinar. We're also gonna slice it into the six different sessions. Give us about 24 hours after the webinar is over. We'll have those posted on our YouTube channel. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, which doesn't cost you anything, you'll get an alert as soon as those are uploaded. Um, you can link to that uh, over on our website. All of our webinars are over there as well on our website. Um, next up, and we'll start a little bit early, we've got uh, Susan Ebner and Jody Reed who have spoken in our uh, FAR, DFARS, and FAR supplement webinars over the last couple of years. Uh, they've uh, covered various topics, uh, including subcontracting, mentor protege, joint ventures, and the whole nine yards. So really happy to have both of these great ladies today to cover legal. Um, so as we mentioned, Jody Reed and Susan Warshaw Ebner. Uh, Jody, I'll let you say a couple words here uh, about yourself and firm, and I'll be quiet. Hi. Um, I, uh, I work for a very small boutique law firm. It's actually just newly formed. Uh, we were smaller before, and we joined with another law firm that was in the same building as us. We basically handle everything from in GovCon space, um, whether it's uh, mergers and acquisitions or um, my specialties in addition to just general government contract stuff is subcontract agreements, prime contract agreements. Um, I do a lot of work with transactional intellectual property kind of uh, documents. Um, I'm also heavily involved with uh, a lot of the cybersecurity stuff that goes on. and uh, that's kind of a the, the two minute thing. So I can almost promise that uh, Susan and I will get you back on track time wise. Okay, good stuff. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm looking forward to your presentation. And Susan, thanks so much for uh, for joining us. Uh, floor is now yours. Thanks, Jan. I want to thank you for asking me again to participate. It's always a pleasure to work with you, and of course with Jody too. I'm a partner at Stinson LLP, where I chair the government contracts and investigations practice. I have uh, more than 40 years of experience advising and representing clients, including lots of small businesses on all aspects of government contracting, including prime and subcontracting and teaming, other transactions, bid protests, and small business size protests and appeals. I also get involved in the contract administration and compliance issues, uh, audits, investigations, and dispute resolution. Uh, if you want to know more about me, as the other speaker from the last session said, check out my LinkedIn profile. I would love to have everybody befriend me. Um, back to you, Jen. Great, thanks, Susan. And again, thanks, Jody. We are now into the legal session. Uh, this will be the second half of today. Uh, and we will go ahead and begin. So I'm gonna mute myself. And you guys just let me know when you're ready for your next slide. Sounds good. Uh, so just to start off the big overview, we've been talking and hearing about a lot of things on the business side, 
You're hearing about compliance too and what you need to do to get business, perform it, and keep it. So today we're going to talk very top level because we don't have a lot of time on how these business needs get lawful, enforceable, and which will help you get paid for what you deliver and to protect your intellectual property from unauthorized use, release, or even theft. Uh, we're going to talk about the subcontract itself and then helpful hints and pitfalls. And last, we'll talk a little bit more about some useful common best practices. Next slide, please. So the subcontract, if you haven't seen one, a lot of different pieces of a subcontract agreements and non-disclosure agreements or NDAs. The subcontract is out what it is you're supposed to do. There are, it's much like a line contract, you know, those contract line items, what your data you're supposed to deliver, what your pricing is, your statement of work, those flow down clauses, both the normal FAR ones and then the special ones, representations and certifications and help you hold your contacts uh, and in terms for how you get paid. Uh, next slide. Jody. Hi, so we're going to talk a little bit now about some helpful hints and some specific FAR clauses that um, are more important. I'm not going to say all the FAR clauses aren't aren't uh, more important, but of course we can't talk about all the FAR clauses. So we've kind of picked the ones that from a subcontracting perspective are some of the most critical ones that you need to pay attention to. We're going to go fairly quickly through this initial page and we're going to probably spend most of our time on the last couple of slides because that's really where I think you um, from a subcontractor's perspective, it's where you get the most attention most of the time. Next slide. So in an ideal world, and way back when, the government came up with the idea of buying stuff as though they were a commercial entity. And for those of us who have been around a long time, um, in, in the mid-90s, there was something called FIRA and FAFSA. And those two clauses, those two pieces of legislation, those two acts basically did a good job of turning things more into a commercial um, contracting. Since then, Congress has ate away at that um, commercial contracting, but it's still from a subcontractor perspective, a much easier way to contract. And in fact, the, your prime contractor is only required to flow down a very, very limited number of um, clauses if you are providing either a commercial item or a commercial service. I will also point out that there's been a recent FAR change that split those two definitions up and the, the definitions are actually in FAR part two. And if the one thing that's key is, and they also, in doing that, one of the things that they did, and I think this is really, really useful for people is, if you provide a commercial product, there's always been a concern about how to have a commercial service. And now they're basically saying if it's, if it's a service that is similar to or pretty much the same as or applying to the, the commercial product that you would have that same kind of service if you were selling to a commercial, a co true commercial company, then it can also be deemed a commercial product or item. <coughs> um, the commercial item provisions and clauses are much, much less but you still might have unique terms and conditions. And unfortunately, a lot of prime contractors, even though you're selling a, 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 uh, a commercial product, will try and have all of their terms and conditions that's in their contract flowed to you, and you just simply need to push back. Next slide. Um, in FAR Part 12.5, there's actually a list of clauses that are not applicable um, to commercial items. And I also want to make clear there's a difference between COTS, which is commercial off the shelf, and just commercial items itself. And finally, there should be a streamlined solicitation and valid me valuation methods. And the big prime contractors, even though this is kind of for, for the government is direction, for the big prime contractors, they pretty much follow the same um, rules and regulations as, if they, as though they were actually a governmental entity. Next slide. And this one comes back to me. So FAR Part 13, Simplified Acquisition Procedures, as Jody was talking about, there's lots of different kinds of contracts out there. Simplified acquisition ones are more streamlined. Uh, they may be uh, more streamlined because they're micro-purchase threshold. 
or they're uh, below the simplified acquisition threshold, or they're commercial items that uh, meet certain uh, dollar thresholds that are listed here. Um, you're going to be putting in these provisions and thinking, I'm doing a simplified acquisition, I'm a subcontractor, and so it's gonna be less clauses and less things to worry about. Whether it's a government purchase card or it's gonna be a formal contract, either way, you're going to have flow down clauses that you're gonna to have to be uh, responsible for. Um, and I think that we'll leave it at that just so that we can focus on uh, the other things that are coming down the pike that are really key to subcontracting. Next slide, please. Part part 16 is another kind of slide. It talks about all the different kinds of contracts that you've got out there. The most important thing is to select the right type of contract. So typically, if your prime contract is going to be a cost reimbursement contract, it may be that they're going to flow down to you a cost reimbursement subcontract. But there could be times when you're delivering a specific widget or a series of widgets or a fixed price service where you can get a fixed price contract. Uh, so you'll have to be thinking about that when you're entering into your subcontracts. The other thing you want to think about is nowadays we have a lot of things in the supply chain that are creating risk out there. There are contracts like fixed price EPAs, which are uh, price escalation clauses. Those might be in the prime contract. Uh, and if they are, you should see if they can get flowed down to you in a subcontract. Additionally, even if they're not in the prime contract, you may want to see if you can get that included in your subcontract. Even though you are a subcontractor, you are supporting the prime contract, and typically your subcontract is going to be a mirror of whatever it is that they do. There are things that you may want to ask for that are above and beyond, or things that perhaps you want to ask for and then get the prime to ask for from the government in order to protect you and make sure that you can perform the way you need to perform. One other thing about this are fixed price contracts. If you're a small business or you're new to the area, you may not have the systems and controls in place to be dealing with cost contracts. Those contracts are very complex. They have more clauses, more requirements for tracking money and making sure that everything is like in its appropriate catalog and column. Fixed price, uh, typically fewer clauses, a little bit more forgiving. So those are things to think about when you're picking contracts. Next slide. And I'd like to just comment a little bit as you're looking at, she's going to the next slide, is the order in which the risk goes. So a firm fixed price, the highest risk is on the contractor, the subcontractor. Lowest risk is obviously on cost. Um, firm fixed price is least risky for the, for the, the prime contractor. And, co and, most, and cost is most risky for prime contractors. So that drives sometimes what the types of contracts can be as well. Yeah, I would, I would just add to that recent cases, particularly in the COVID area and with inflation, contractors have been getting stuck with fixed price contracts with no wiggle room uh, to recover for the increased costs. Uh, so if you have that kind of situation, that's definitely something you want to get ahead of as soon as possible. You want to try and resolve it, not at a claim stage, but at a contract either negotiation or change stage where you can substantiate the exact reasons why you're being impacted by this. But Jody's right, fixed price is always, it's a less risky proposition because you have a finite amount that you have to do for a finite price. But there are uh, problems these days with COVID and the supply chain that make it a little bit risky from an inflation and other kind of issue that you really want to watch out for. Or and here, yeah, go ahead. DOD's yeah, and DOD has actually gotten a little bit ahead of that in that they have put out a a DFAR, uh, I'm not sure, is it FAR or DFAR? Um, it's an OS, OSD memorandum. And it's an OSD thought. memorandum, yeah. okay, so it's, but it is the Department of the Defense that they're basically telling the different government contracting organizations that if you get a contractor coming back in and asking for more money because of inflation, that in essence, that is a justification to give them more money. Um, and, but I, I haven't seen any of it being implemented at this point or any of the contracting officers actually granting that. Have you heard any of those, Susan? Uh, no. Well, I, I would say this. I, I did most important cases for the ABA and did a whole thing on all of these COVID cases. And uh, the only ones that gave any relief were where they were actually able to show that there was a change like one that you would normally see under the changes clause. 
uh, the DOD uh, provisions that say, you know, if they say it's going to cost more money, consider it. It's an unfunded mandate, meaning they have not allotted money right. to pay for it. So again, it's really going to be you having to establish why it is you're entitled to it and really turning square corners on the changes clause and what it really is going to take to make that uh, happen. If you find yourself in one of those situations, I think uh, best advice is consult with counsel to see if we can they can come up with something that's going to help you on that. For part 16, lots of different kinds of contracts. So we have the fixed price and the cost reimbursement. But in addition, we have these things called indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts, sometimes called IDIQs, sometimes basic ordering agreements, BAAs. Uh, those are typically overarching contract vehicles where you've established what it is that's going to be sold and you've established pricing in terms of it could be hourly rates, it could be prices of materials, whatever. And then they will issue orders, and depending upon how um, they're issuing the order, they could be asking for fixed price or cost reimbursement kinds of delivery orders or task orders uh, for, for uh, bidding and, and getting those contracts. Time and materials are more like cost reimbursement in terms of like you've established what the rate is, and that's a question of how much time are you going to be spending and what's the cost of your materials. Uh, letter contracts may or may not be definitized. You know, we're seeing a lot of UCAs these days in the very big contracts. Those are undefinitized contract actions. Uh, really would encourage folks that get UCAs or unpriced actions to try and negotiate them as soon as possible. The more you go on in terms of uh, performing contracts, you get to that end, the more they're likely to squeeze you on profit. Say, you've already done it. There is no risk. Why should I give you profit? So um, thinking about that earlier is better. Uh, other kinds of agreements out there, basic ordering agreements uh, and other agreements to agree. There's a variety of different kinds of contracts. Uh, the key here is you may think that you are a vendor or supplier, meaning, oh, I'm just sending my commercial items to you. I don't need to worry about these kinds of things. At, I would warn you that if you're providing supplies, equipment or services, in performance of a government contract, whether you label yourself a vendor or supplier, you are going to have to comply with those flow down clauses that come. So unless you're exempt through some specific commercial item exemption or dollar threshold or something else, uh, you still will have to worry about flow down clauses. Jody, anything to say before we go to the next slide? Yeah, one other thing is this, I think this is very important to understand and it follows up with what you've just said is, your contract with a prime contractor is a state contract. That means it's subject to state law. And there are some states, and there's been some courts over the years, that have, that have viewed the entire GovCon thing where we say, oh, but it's self-deleting and stuff like that, where they said, nope, we don't understand what a self-deleting clause is. You allowed it to be in your contract. It is, it is part of your contract. And so that's another thing you really got to watch carefully. And the other thing is, is that we talked about the fact that time, materials, labor, hour, and letter contracts, not so much the, latter, the last one, but time, material, and labor, hour contracts are considered to be cost-type contracts, and that has an implication for fee, which basically means your, your profits you're allowed to do in there is set by the FAR and maximized at 10%. Um, if it's a fixed-price contract, your proposal max profit is 15%. If you're selling a commercial item, there is no max profit that is in the FAR. It is whatever the commercial price is that the commercial market is determined is the price, which is another argument, by the way, for going commercial. And, and I would say the flip side of if it's in your contract, you have to comply, is if you're a subcontractor and they leave out clauses that at a prime level, they might they would have to comply with if it's not there under the Christian doctrine because it's an important public policy. There have been no cases yet that have gone the further of saying, okay, it's not in your subcontract. So even though it's an important public policy, we're going to read it in there. There are no cases that are doing that. So well, except uh, to DL Christian originally. Right. So D, well, DL Christian. Oh, you got to have a contract. It typically prime contract. You only yes. get to put down important public policy. So check and see what's yep. in there. Um, let's go to the next slide. You can, we're 
kind of try and kind of speed up a little bit, make sure we cover everything. Yeah. So, Joe, back to you. I think if you take anything else away from this presentation is the government's work with intellectual property is that the organization that creates the intellectual property gets to own the intellectual property. There is no actual obligation on the subcontractor's part to give anything other than a license to the um, the prime to pass it on to the federal government. If you develop stuff, the federal government gets a license. They don't get they don't get ownership. There's a couple of exceptions, but we're not going to get into that. But for the most part, contractors keep ownership. Subcontractors keep ownership, or they're supposed to. So when you're looking at, um, and by the way, I've looked at a bunch of these prime contracts, but one of the things a lot of prime contractors will do is they will put language in there that says, no, they own the intellectual property. And you have to push back, you have to push back to say, no, I own the intellectual property. You're going to get a license to give it to the government and the government gets unlimited rights, but there's no obligation on your part to give any more rights to the prime contractors. Um, they don't like it. When you push back, we all know that, but the reality is, is if you're developing stuff and you think, especially if it's something you maybe want to be able to sell to somebody else, you need to have ownership. And that is what is compliant with the law, basically, um, and the regulations and the Bayh-Dole Act. And if you ever want to read a really cool story, Google the history of the Bayh-Dole Act, um, and it's a pretty cool history. And I also tell you, the first time I ever heard Bayh-Dole, I never saw it right now, I was in a presentation, and I really have a hard time trying to figure out why people were trying to tell, why the government was telling you had to buy Dole bananas. But that was just me. <laughs> well, Next I mean, the, oh, yeah, was, the other piece about this is um, asserting your rights. So, I mean, this yeah. is, we can cover all of this in uh, such a short period of time. And maybe Jennifer wants to do something with us uh, where we can lay out a little bit more on how to protect your rights. But if you don't assert it, even if you have bought it, you may lose it. So again, and then it has to be in the contract attachment, yep. data yep. assertion. So uh, anyway, that's another thing to keep thinking of. And uh, sorry, we have to just keep going. But if you have interest in this, just contact us. We can talk to you. Yes. Next slide. Our part thirty-one. So I, I and a lot of people get scared about numbers and dollars. Uh, top level part 31 deals with tracking costs that are allowable, allocable, and reasonable. That's the aim of pricing for the government. So you want to make sure you're only going to be charging the government for those costs that are allowable to, to your contract. Uh, and that could be, you know, like, I'm not going to be charging you for something that I did under a different contract. I can only charge you for the things that are directly under this contract unless it's in overhead and GNA, right? So you wanna make sure you're only charging for those allowable costs. There's a list in part 31 of the types of costs that are allowable. If you're going and being investigated in a criminal action, that's not gonna be considered an allowable cost. On the other hand, if you're involved in a dispute with regard to something relating to the contract, potentially could be an allowable cost. A lot of different rules on this, I don't wanna get too deep in the weeds, but uh, part 31 lays out all the different kinds of costs that are out there that might be allowable. Al allocability is the concept of where these costs are going to be allocated among your different contracts. So for example, you may have uh, cost pools out there that you're establishing for your uh, fixed price contracts. And you may have a separate one for your cost reimbursement, or you may have a combined cost pool for both. So depending upon how you allocate it, uh, those costs that go into there, then they get prorated according to the allocability. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a lot, it's, I'm trying to summarize something and it's allocable. So if it is allocable to the contract because it applies to it properly and proportionately, that's some of the key stuff. The other pieces, you can have allowable expenses, you can have them allocated the right way, but if they're not reasonable costs, then it's not going to meet the last prong of cost principles out there. So reasonableness is one where we're looking at how much you're charging. Jody was talking about 
commercial item pricing and you can charge your commercial items, they're not going to look at profit. But reasonableness, if you're selling it to everybody else and then you're trying to charge the government more, like the original list price, instead of what you actually charge them, there might be pushback on reasonableness. Um, there are a lot of other rules on this, but we'll, for the time being, move on. But again, questions, don't hesitate. So and the I one key that. thing about, about the allowability, the reasonableness, way back when, um, it was presumed in cost type contracts, if you spent the money, it was a reasonable cost. That is no longer true. The government will actually question costs that you have spent, that you thought were reasonably to spend. Exactly true. And they'll do it in an audit that will take time and effort. So yes. if you're going to do something, make sure you're documenting everything you do. So it's a lot easier to substantiate what you did. Next slide. John, you Part 33, next slide. Protests. First of all, you are a subcontractor. You do not have standing to protest. If your prime contractor decides to protest, then you may get a benefit from us. But that's one of the other things you want to look at. I see this all the time in teaming agreements, and we can have a whole other conversation on teaming agreements. But I see in teaming agreements that once a contract has been awarded, that the teaming agreement expires. Well, if there's a protest, you kind of want to have the teaming agreement still be in existence. So, um, you want to make sure that your teaming agreement language has a continue and all protests are resolved. Um, there's only two places that protests can go. They can either, well, three, agency protests, which quite honestly, um, I've not heard anyone say that that's been an awesome way to go. Um, I've seen a couple over the X number of years I've been doing this that had some benefit for an agency protest, but for the most part, it's not very useful. So you're really looking at GAO protests and court of federal claims. Um, and those are the two areas that you can do the protest. And again, you as a subcontractor do not have standing, only your prime does. Likewise, when we start talking about disputes and appeals, the Contract Disputes Act does not apply to subcontractors. No matter how many times I see in subcontract agreements they've included, the, the, the Contract Disputes Act is, as a flow down clause, mostly because they were just lazy to not clean up their flow down clauses, it will never ever apply to you. Um, there is a difference between submitting a request for equitable adjustments and the allowability of the cost and submission of a claim. And there's certain requirements that have to go for a claim. And if you ever want to appeal a claim, it has to be a proper claim. It's also going to require that to be a contracting officer's final decision on a claim in order for you to do an appeal. There is something called the Severin Doctrine. And what this does is it allows you to stand in the shoes of your prime or have the prime prosecute and defend on your behalf. Most of the time, those clauses will show up in your subcontract agreements and they will say also things like, if the contracting officer makes a decision, um, then that's gonna be binding on you. Um, and you just wanna be able to have in there the extra language or the extra statement that basically says, if the contracting officer makes a decision that affects you, even if the prime contractor doesn't really want to file a claim or a request for equitable adjustment, they will agree to allow you to submit that through them um, to object to the contracting officer's decision, whether it's actually a full on just within the, the, the uh, with the contracting officer, or whether it's a full on appeal to um, one of the applicable courts. And as far as that goes is concerned, your appeals really are going to either going to be to one of the two boards of contract appeals or the court of federal claims there used to be jurisdiction in the the other federal courts uh that jurisdiction has been removed um anything susan otherwise we can go to the next slide yeah i guess i i would just add in a couple things um one that you know again you write into your subcontract agreement the terms under which you want to proceed so sometimes uh, the contractor, the prime contractor is the one prosecuting the case, but you may have the right, for example, to have your own counsel or to consent to their counsel or to participate. These are things you wanna make sure you're addressing how you wanna deal with it if there is a dispute. Uh, the other thing is sometimes we see subcontract disputes, uh, they don't get to court, they get resolved or they get subject to, they get handled subject to state law. 
So the prime contract dispute is going to be at the forms that Jody's talking about, but the subcontract dispute may very well be in a state court. I, I've certainly appeared at the you know, Fairfax County Courthouse on a subcontract dispute. Um, you know, so it just depends on how you write that. But if you have a dispute with your prime, that will likely go through a state court uh, tribunal unless there's diversity, which is another complex legal thing that we'll say for another day. Hey, Susan, yeah. how about if we go down to legal compliance best practices and get those last couple of slides? Because we only have five more minutes. Yeah, that's what I was worried about, too. I think that's good. So okay. let's move over to slide 19. Forward. 19? Yeah. Yeah, one forward more. 19 is what I'm showing. Keep, yep, yeah, one more. There we go. Yes. Okay, here we go. So there's a lot of things that we cover here. Jody, chime in when you want. Reps and certs. Representations and certifications. A prime contractor is required to be registered in the System for Award Management, or SAM. Uh, subs sometimes are required to be registered in SAM. You know, just remember, if you are not registered in SAM, they are likely to give you that list of representations and certifications for you to certify to, and compliance and ensuring that they are accurate and complete is essential, because you effectively are saying, this is the truth. And if there's something that's not accurate, it could expose you to a potential false claim or other kind of problem out there. So if you're asked to sign representations and certifications, you wanna make sure they're right. If your situation changes, you wanna make sure you're updating it. Uh, we've got something in here on size status. If you're a small business and you're getting your subcontract, you are getting your subcontract and representing typically that you are a small business under the NAICS code that was applicable to this contract. If you have a corporate restructuring, you sell, you, um, you buy a company, your size status changes, you get a large contract where you accumulate all these contracts and the revenue size or the number of employees lifts you over the small business size standard for the NAICS code, uh, you may well have an, a situation where you need to uh, advise on a change in your size status. Although uh, if you have a size status, typically as a prime, you get the contract until there is an option. You don't have to be uh, worried about the fact that your status has changed. It's a little bit of a complex situation here. A lot of different rules on this. Uh, so size status is something to really watch out for. Jody, do you want to say anything else on size yeah, status? Yeah, so the other thing with size status you have to keep in mind is a, what's called affiliation. And this is what trips up a lot of companies. They come out and they say, hey, I'm um, I'm only, you know, I only sell $3 million worth of work. I fit within the size and this. Yes. But their own, say, for example, by a um, equity firm, right? And the equity firm has four or five mm -hmm. other companies well, when you look at size status, all those other companies will come into it under the uh, under an argument of affiliation, and that can trip you over into being a large business as well. Um, and when you be, trip over to being a large business, there's a, d a bunch of other requirements related to some of your written policies and procedures that you're now going to start having to have. Um, the other big thing that you're going to see these days, and it's 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 huge. It's been huge for some time, but it's, it's, it's gotten a lot of attention anymore. Is the next thing we have on here, which is cybersecurity. Um, if you are in just, if you're not in the DOD space, as it stands right now, you only have to comply with the 52204-11 basic um, safeguarding. And that's, and honestly, that is pretty basic. Basically, it's, you know, people coming into your facility have to have a badge. Um, people who, are into your computer systems usually have to have dual factor authentication and so forth like that if you are a dod contractor however your requirements and what you have to be compliant with goes up dramatically um, and it's going to even go up more when we start talking about cmmc 2.0 which fortunately enough is probably still not going to get implemented in may which is what they said they're now looking at possibly the end of the government fiscal year in the September timeframe. But if you're a DOD contractor, you need to be very concerned that your, your systems are compliant with the cybersecurity requirements that are on the uh, 
the 800-171 and at moving toward a CMMC 2.0. Okay, um, Jody, I would just cut us off. I think we're, yeah, let me just sum up and say there are other issues here we haven't covered today. Uh, not enough time to do it, but domestic preference, infrastructure, any kinds of monies are all going to have domestic preference rules. So uh, really pay attention to what your requirements are and make sure that you're taking steps to protect what you need to protect and that the agreement you have really says what you intended to include. Uh, and one final word from me, read your contract. Seriously, yeah. read it before you sign it. And if you don't understand something, contact an attorney. Great, thank you so much, Larry. Great contact. to have you both on the program. Uh, Susan and Jody, great information. Uh, the slides will be sent out in an email. You can also find today's recording on our YouTube channel. That's if you just go over to jennifershouse.com, top right hand corner, I believe, has a link to our YouTube channel. If you subscribe to that, it won't cost you anything and you'll get an alert as soon as this webinar is uploaded. Uh, now we're going to move on to pricing. Uh, I know Susan and Jody touched on a couple legal aspects of pricing, but we've got the lovely and talented uh, Marsha Lindquist and her counterpart today, Michael Gallo. Uh, these two are a, a dynamic duo. We're very fortunate to have them with us, along with all of our other speakers today, a lot of rock stars here. And uh, I'm going to stop talking in the interest of time. And Marsha, the floor is all yours. Well, I'll just have one quick thing to introduce. Um, I've been supporting the GovCon market with pricing strategy and cost accounting for over 30 plus years. Um, in my book, Secrets of Strategic Pricing for Government Contractors, you will find many tools and processes for strategic pricing federal proposals. I'll turn it over to Mike, my wonderful colleague. Great. Thanks, Marsha. Michael, over to you. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mike Gallo with Federal Pricing Group. Uh, federal Pricing Group is a boutique consulting firm. We specialize in federal contracts pricing and provide uh, advisory training and hands-on consulting support services to both government primes and to government subcontractors. I'm happy to be here today. Great. Thank you both. I'm going to uh, mute myself and just let me know when you're ready for the next slide. We're ready. <laughs> So in this slide, there's a really important message which is right at the top, and that everybody wins when everybody plays right in the sandbox. And we didn't put that in there, but that's what we mean. Here's the thing about subcontractors. You, you really need to be part of the pricing dialogue, and you need to petition with your prime to do that, because otherwise prime contractors will decide a lot of things themselves. They will not necessarily invite teammates into the pricing strategy. Um, but if you ask to be included, particularly if you have an important have important input either about your customer, about um, information that you have about the the proposal that you're going after, it's important for you to say something to your prime contractor and become part of that dialogue of you know what's going to be involved in the pricing and the pricing strategy. It's really important to know that the um, that the team needs to cooperate, not only with with the prime, but also one another. If you are part of the team, you need to help craft the right price. Now, what do I mean by that? The right price doesn't happen by accident, okay? If the prime wins, you win, and you want that to happen. Otherwise, why would you even bid in the first place? All teammates need to cooperate on providing timely data to the prime contractor, getting to an agreeable price, and supporting all the requests for the, or for the government requirements because it's not just the prime who has the requirements to submit, it's you too as the subcontractor. Every party has to have their own responsibilities in the uh, team pricing effort, effort. Everybody has a role. And while the prime may have targets for, for you, um, and they won't necessarily share it right away, uh, each subcontractor has a role in crafting their price, their best price, and not exceeding their overall target, which you will either get from your prime or ask the prime for, okay? So 
subcontractors must adhere strictly to the letter of the RFP requirements. And I'll tell you, and Mike will, will attest to this too, there have been protests where subcontractors do not submit all the data required by the RFP and the bid gets thrown out. So Mike, I'm gonna turn it to you right now. Thanks, Marsha. And I think one thing that uh, subcontractors need to appreciate is in a typical proposal, the prime is delivering one proposal when we talk about the technical and management volumes, but that's not true for pricing. You would literally, if you had five uh, subcontractors on the team, it's six pricing proposals potentially that are getting submitted to the government. It's the primes who's got everybody, and then every individual subcontractor potentially is also having to submit separate pricing information uh, that the government evaluators will look at. So it's a much more complicated beast than when we're talking about the other proposal volumes. And one of the reasons why it's such a challenge for the prime uh, to herd all these cats essentially uh, when they're building pricing. So why don't we move on to the next slide? So this is an important piece that's, that's critical for all subcontractors to understand. You can rack the price or you can make it a win. You individually, yes, may be an important ingredient in making something a win. If you hold out to get the, your desired price, um, you would get on the wrong side of the prime contractor, most importantly. You would delay the, the, the price green team reviews, and you would hinder the team's ability to pivot on price quickly and reasonably. You must be able to, how could I say this, negotiate and work with the prime to achieve the right balance, but holding out is never a good thing. Mike, over to you. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I think you really need to have an appreciation for the kind of risks that the prime contractor takes on when they invite you to be part of the, the bidding team. And that's especially true, that risk is especially true if, if it's a new relationship where the prime really doesn't have experience with you, the subcontractor. You can look at GAO protests. Uh, Marsha mentioned you know, how a subcontractor can really uh, wreck the pricing. One of the examples, uh, the subcontractor had to submit uh, their own package because it contained proprietary data. And they elected to submit that information directly to the government. And they failed to submit, to upload the, the, their pricing proposal to the government portal uh, until after the proposal due date, the overall due date. And consequently, the, the, um, the evaluators did not have the information available to evaluate the prime's pricing proposal because the uh, subcontractor's pricing data was not allowed to be introduced uh, into the evaluation. And guess what? The entire proposal was, uh, was thrown out. So not only does the sub lose, but ultimately the prime and the rest of the teammate because of that. So it's really essential that subcontractors understand both the prime contractor's pricing responsibilities in this process, as well as their own um, responsibilities as a subcontractor. And Marsha and I are gonna go over some of those responsibilities on the next two slides. Right. So uh, let's go over to, uh, to the next slide where we talk about the prime's pricing responsibilities. You can see from this long list that the prime has quite a bit, and we haven't even listed everything here, okay? I do want to really hone in on that first point because the prime ultimately has the responsibility to submit a compliant proposal and do it timely. By the way, so do the subs, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But when you, um, the prime, when you are the prime, you have to respect the fact that you have to help the prime achieve their proposal objectives with all the data on time, complete, and correct. So you have a responsibility to your prime contractor to help them help you and help the team. Their responsibility is to assemble all the ingredients into a compliant proposal and they make it easy for the contracting officer and the rest of the evaluators to evaluate the total proposal. So you can see here, there's, like I say, there's a long list of things here. But again, the prime has a huge responsibility to making the price proposal something that the government will go, aha, we have everything that we need. Mike, on to you. 
Yeah, you know, Marsha, this really is a jigsaw puzzle for the, the prime to fit all these uh, pieces together. And you, the subcontractor, really have a lot less headaches than the prime does. It, you know, one of the, the headaches that the prime has is they are responsible for also documenting that they, how they found your subcontractor price fair and reasonable on behalf of the government. And, and that means the prime is ultimately going to be looking to you, subcontractor, to provide extra details on your cost and pricing to help them make those uh, sorts of determinations. And you should be expecting them to ask those questions, and you should be expecting to have to defend uh, your pricing to the prime contractor to help them make that uh, determination. You, Jennifer's webinar series uh, is going to review the 40 largest uh, prime contractors, and all those primes are going to have mature procurement systems and processes in place and procedures for soliciting uh, subcontractor pricing data, and they have resources to help you do that and, and submit a good bid. That's not necessarily going to be true for the other smaller primes that are out there that you might do business with, and they may in fact neglect their responsibilities to do this due diligence. So remember this, just because a prime doesn't request this additional data from you, it doesn't mean either of you are off the hook ultimately in the prime having to uh, make those determinations and document that for the government. And if they don't, the government still will come in and ask for that information ultimately uh, during evaluations. And so, and Mike, I just one last point that I yeah. want to underline here, and that is that you have to respect that the prime has that responsibility to conduct cost or price analyses and support them, because the more you support them, the better off they are going to be able to defend not only yours but the entire proposal. Go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry. Absolutely. I know. And, and so that, that's definitely part of the subcontractor's responsibility, too, in this process, which we're going to cover in, in the next slide. And I'll, I'll kick things off, Marsha. Okay. There's, a, there's quite a list for subcontractors as well in terms of what their responsibilities are in this process. And I'd like to just touch on that first one which actually was talked about in the previous presentation too, in terms of subcontractors really need to understand contract types. And here, Marsh and I are talking about pricing types of, of, of contracts. So we're, either it's a cost reimbursement type contract, it's a fixed price type contract, or it's a time and materials type contract. Each of them uh, comes with their own pricing strategies and risk uh, profile, and they each have implications in terms of documentation requirements ultimately in proposal submissions. It's really important that you, the subcontractor, have a firm grip and understand what each of these subcon of each of these contract types means and how it is going to affect you, the subcontractor. And this is especially true in the case if you're going to get involved in having a cost type subcontract, that all the rules that you heard about in terms of allowability and allocability goes up a notch because you're going to have to provide documentation to the government uh, to demonstrate that your proposed costs uh, meet all that criteria definition, and uh, there's extra time and effort in doing so. Marsha, what would you emphasize on this list? Well, on this one, I want to talk about number three in particular and number four, but I want to caution the subcontractors out there that you have to keep in mind that the right price is what the entire team needs to win, not just yours. So if, if, if everybody doesn't play nice in the sandbox, back to our, our earlier slide, then the team may not win. You know, you, you must be able to negotiate with your prime to achieve the right balance for you and your, and your company, but you also have to keep in mind that it's not just you. But most importantly here, you have to fully understand the RFP requirements, okay? What does that mean? Too often I hear subcontractors say, well, here, here are my numbers, see you later. And that's not the case. You need to ask questions of your prime and be sure you understand that you, most times, have the same requirements for data as the prime does. Uh, oftentimes in the RFP, it will state that the subcontractor needs to adhere to the same requirements that the prime does. So read the RFP, particularly that section L and that section M, because it will say that right in there, okay? 
if that's the case, you need to read and digest in, you know, what you're doing and put it into a compliance matrix, all the detailed requirements that you've got. In fact, sometimes I, I say to subcontractors, why don't you ask your prime contractor for their compliance matrix for the price volume because you have to do the same thing. Because you are the subcontractor does not absolve you of your responsibilities for data submittals, um, sometimes including written price text, um, you know, information that the government is looking for on you. Mike already talked about how um, an entire bid was tossed out because the subcontractor didn't submit that data in time. Now, I, I will talk about participating in price strategy and the preliminary pricing. What do I mean by that? I would encourage you to talk with your prime to include you in their pricing strategy sessions because you have a better chance of helping the team if you as a subcontractor know what's going on and have a voice in it. A lot of prime contractors won't allow you into that but I uh, like to encourage subcontractors to invite, you know, find out if they can be invited into that uh, discussion. Give your prime contractor preliminary pricing, even if they've not asked for it. If you've signed a teaming agreement, you can share pricing information with your prime and help them shape the right price with your early participation. The sooner you can get involved in the pricing process, the better chance you as the team not only will you know will will get to the right price, but you as a subcontractor will be seen as a big asset for the team. Mike, you've got things you want to say on this slide too. Uh, yeah, I, I think the other punchline, and if you are participating actively in the process, you should be getting to a point where you can agree on price with the prime as you march towards proposal submission, and that's so important. You really don't want to put the prime in the position where you know we're getting to the end and still not have reached agreement on pricing. The prime is still going to submit the proposal, and you really don't want to put them in the uncomfortable position of having to represent a price for your part of the contract that differs from what you think it is. You've just invited the the, the government to open discussions to address the discrepancy and you've decreased your chances potentially of winning the contract if the government decides ultimately they don't even want to enter into discussions with you to resolve it. If there's mm -hmm. another team that already has their pricing full resolved and the other um, aspects of that other team's proposal uh, looks pretty good to the government, you could put yourself in a situation where you don't get that second chance to resolve that issue. So actively participating in those pricing dialogues and, and and being accommodative to, to reach a good agreement on pricing with the prime is essential. Let's go ahead and move on. Right. And, and Marsha touched on pricing. Marsha, why don't you continue that thought on yeah, the let process? Me, yeah, let me talk about the process just a wee bit. Um, the process really breaks down into pre-RFP stage, an RFP stage, and a post-RFP stage for simplicity, okay? In, uh, Mike and I are really big fans, shall we say, of early pricing involvement. That means in the pre-RFP stage, you are involved, even if you're a subcontractor, in obtaining all of these things that we've got listed here on the left-hand side. You're, you would want to be involved in the customer research, knowledge of their pricing habits and their hot buttons about price. You would want to be uh, involved in uh, pricing data calls because that's where, like Mike was talking about, uh, all of those early decisions and working out the right price happens. It happens early in the game. It should not happen late in the game because you want to give your prime data in the draft stage of a proposal and, and that allows you to have those open discussions about price early on so that you don't wait for the data between you to, to, to flow at a later date. You want to have those discussions. The draft RFP is where you could be able to and should be able to get into your own internal modeling started. This is where you research information about salaries or you 
take a look at your own indirect rates, or maybe you need to um, augment your discussion about salary or or uh, get information about other direct costs or information that will allow you to make intelligent decisions about your pricing sooner rather than later. If your, uh, your technical people are involved in solutioning, this is where you get to engage with not only your team, but the prime contractor as well on the pricing solution so that the team uh, doesn't envision something so lofty that you can't, you've got to cut back and make last minute decisions. This is where you can provide data when you have it so that it allows for an early, easy flowing discussion between you and the prime contractor. And again, draft pricing strategy that we talk about is where you begin to strategize as an active member of the team on the pricing direction so that you can help shape the final price. Your homework, like we've got down there at the bottom, just can't wait for the final RFP because this is where a lot of the decisions and judgments get made is in the pre-RFP stage. Mike, I know you've got some great things to say here. Yes, uh, so in the next stage in the RFP, when that drops, you know, for the prime, it's a bad dash to get everything assembled and, and the pricing, uh, you know, in one uh, piece. And it's, pricing is, is one of the worst headaches for the prime. Uh, did we mention before, Marsha, that there's not one proposal, there's many proposals, many proposals. When, when it comes right. to the pricing. Um, right. So, yes, the prime is going to be unreasonable when they come to you and ask for your pricing submission at a date that's earlier than you want to provide it, much earlier than the ultimate due date. Yeah, that's because the prime has this responsibility to integrate all these pieces together into a, and fit them all together in, into a, a whole. Um, I would also say by the same token, all the homework that Marsha mentioned in the pre-RFP stage and all the drills that the prime has to go through once the final drop, it's a lot of pressure and a little bit of time. I. But so by the same token, I would say if it's the first time you're hearing from Prime is when the final RFP drops about an opportunity, you might want to very carefully consider whether or not it's worth your time, money, and energy to participate in, in the bid if this is the first time the Prime is approaching you and, and the RFP is already on the street. You might be better off waiting for a, a better op opportunity. And uh, that's just a, uh, some food for thought. Uh, don't also forget, uh, in the, once the proposal is submitted, you may not be complete with your pricing. Uh, depending on whether or not the government wants to get clarifications and or enter into discussions and ask for revised pricing, some of that might fall back on you, the subcontractor, because there's questions about uh, your uh, pricing submission. So be ready to support your prime contractor if and when uh, any discussion uh, questions come out from the government. The pressure was bad and the final RFP came out. It's even more intense when the government enters into discussions because the timelines sometimes are very brief. So be ready to be fully supportive of your prime contractor if the government asks questions and asks for pricing revisions. So Mike, before we move on to the next slide, I want to make an important point here, okay? And that's where we talk about pricing reviews, okay? If you are engaging in those pricing reviews with your prime contractor throughout the process, it should not come as a big surprise in the post RFP stage that they are maybe asking you for some concessions on your price afterwards, uh, right. you know, perhaps for a best and final. So if you are engaging all along in the pricing strategy and you're having those pricing discussions all along and early on as well, then hopefully it should not come as a big surprise to you that they are gonna be asking you for something. Presumably they should be engaging in those discussions in a very constructive way. Totally agree. Okay, so let's um, move on to our, our last slide where we wrap up. And, and in this particular slide, Mike, I know you like some of the, let, let me let you do some of the do's, okay? Okay, yes, so we've, we've kind of summarized everything from our previous content, some key do's and don'ts. On the do side, Marsha mentioned the pricing data calls. I think that's really important to timely submit an answer 
those data calls, uh, sometimes they're piecemeal uh, and they're pieces of information that the Prime is looking from you to get the, the process started. Answer those data calls, uh, be complete in your responses and be timely. It's in your best interest. If the, if the Prime asks, for example, for a rate card with rates for various labor categories, give them what they request, fill in as much as you think you can actually execute and put yourself in the position to, to maybe pick up some more work for the prime and doing the prime a favor, because if your pricing is very competitive, you might actually be helping them early in the stage develop a, a good pricing solution where maybe you might get some more work out of the deal because you were prompt and complete and thorough in, in your uh, responses. Uh, Marsh, if you don't mind, I'd like to jump over to one of the don'ts that's, that's also hot on my list. Okay. Um, and that's the first one in, in terms of proprietary data. Uh, you as a subcontractor should not be submitting proprietary pricing data to, to the prime. And the prime sometimes might just ask for it that way because the government is asking for that details. It's not in your interest ultimately long term to provide that data directly to the prime. They're a teammate today, they may be a competitor tomorrow. And if you give them that information, you're helping them, form, giving them the tools essentially to figure out your pricing potentially on a, on a future competition. So you should take, take the steps to be separating that information and disclosing that through a proper channel, either as a sealed submission package that, that the prime will give to the government on your behalf, or you submitting that information directly to the government and making sure that you submit it on time and don't, and don't ruin the, the, the prime's overall bid. Marsha, you wanna emphasize a couple? Yeah, I do. Um, in particular on the due side, I want to make sure, and I've probably said it too much here, but definitely participate in pricing dialogue with your prime contractor, okay? Um, and, and it's really critical that you have that discussion because you don't want it to just be from the prime, here are your targets or here is your target, get to that number. You would like to understand what's behind it because presumably that kind of conversation, um, let me say this, Silent subcontractors often do not get the work share that they want, by, but by participating in the pricing dialogue, you have your own voice heard and get to shape the direction of the team's pricing goals, okay? Um, one other thing on the do side I want to emphasize, Mike, and that is to reread and re-review all of the things that you are required to do. Make that last minute connection with your own compliance matrix to make sure you do everything that you're supposed to do. Um, on the don't side, I'm going to say, Mike, um, don't hold the prime hostage. I have right. been in that situation where I have been working with a, uh, with a prime and the prime, uh, the, the subcontractor held out. They held out to like a day before, two days before with their pricing because they were trying to not get a cut from the prime contractor. Don't do that to them. Keeping your price details to yourself will not endear you to your prime or the rest of the teammates. Because by holding out on the price data, you put the prime at risk of not achieving the team price goal. And that's got to happen. Mike? Yeah, I think on uh, for me, one of the other don'ts here as we wrap up is you really want to be careful about getting into situations where you're going to enter into a cost type subcontract. If you're a small business, it's odds are likely that you don't have experience and your accounting system might not be adequate yet to handle cost type contracts. It's a whole other level of uh, burden and it, uh, in terms of administrative burden and proposal pricing preparation burden to do a cost type contract. So if a prime is asking you to enter into a cost type subcontract, please take the time to understand what you're getting yourself involved into and make sure ahead of time that your systems are set up properly to handle cost type uh, contracts. Excellent, yep. Uh, I think Jennifer, that's what we've got for today. All right, Marsha that's and it. Michael, the dynamic duo covering pricing. That was excellent, outstanding as usual. So thank you guys for taking the time to put together the great materials that you did. I liked your slides a lot and your content and um, excellent delivery. So any last um, thoughts before we move on to compliance from either of you? I think we've got it. Thank you. I, yes, thank you, Jennifer.
Great. Thank you both. And uh, see you maybe on the other side. Uh, now we're going to dig into compliance. This is our final session. As a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded. If you go over to our website, which is simply jennifershouse.com, uh, at the top right-hand corner, there's a link to go over to YouTube. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, it doesn't cost you anything. You'll get access to 600 plus, uh, almost 600, sorry, uh, government contracting webinars. And if you subscribe, you'll get an alert as soon as today's webinar is uploaded. Uh, we'll also email that out to you uh, with the link and you'll get a copy of the slides, which can be found right now, actually, on slideshare.net. Um, just find our page over there, uh, Jennifer Schaus, and all of our webinar PowerPoints are there. So last but not least, we're getting ready to cover compliance. We've got two more rock stars here with us today, Dr. Dolores uh, Katrina Messina and Jeff Shapiro. So, Dolores, thank you so much for joining us today. I'll be quiet and let you say what uh, what you want to here. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Dolores Cucina Messina. I am the CEO and founder of Rixada Solutions, um, providing creative contract solutions for government and organizations, small to medium businesses, um, and also just a huge contracts nerd. So it's an honor to be here among all of the speakers and also with everyone that's listening. Great, thank you so much, Dolores. And Jeff Shapiro, uh, uh, you've spoken in some of our webinars in the past, I know. Uh, so Jeff, thanks for joining us today and the floor is all yours. Thanks, Jennifer, so glad to be back here today. Uh, thrilled to be talking about one, one of my favorite topics, just like uh, Dolores, you know, yep, uh, I'm a compliance and contract nerd myself too, so happy to uh, join that, that that social group. Anyhow, uh, I, I'm a partner at Cohen Resnick. We're a large uh, a national uh, CPA and business advisory firm. Uh, I, I'm a partner within the government contracting practice. We provide a wide range of advisory services for government contractors, as well as being a uh, government contractor ourselves. We serve as the, uh, the contract auditing uh, specialist uh, team to oversee a number of civilian agencies uh, uh, contract audit needs and looking forward to providing my perspective today. Fantastic. Thank you both. And okay, as we said, uh, Dolores and Jeff are covering compliance. I'm going to put myself on mute and you guys just let me know when you're ready for your next slide. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to do just a quick overview uh, and a visual for everyone here about, you know, what does privity of contract mean? And when we're talking about the subcontractor and prime relationship. It could mean one of two things or one of many things, um, as you can see from this graphic. So generally, when we think about the prime, we're thinking of the direct line between government and the main prime contractor that has that agreement with the government. Um, but you could also be a sub uh, as a second tier, meaning that you are a sub to a sub and so on. Um, that does happen, especially with some of the larger efforts. And so just to keep in mind that as you're going down the line of all of these relationships to make sure that you are following the best practices that you've heard today um, and making sure that you are keeping in mind as how it applies to you as an organization, because essentially your subcontract is a commercial agreement and you're there to support the prime contractor that has the contract with the government. Um, but your relationship with your entity that you're con contracting with um, is a technically a business to business agreement. Uh, Jeff, did you have anything you wanted to add to this slide? No, I, I appreciate that. I, again, I want to repeat what Dolores just said. This is a commercial contract. Uh, and I think uh, Jody mentioned it earlier in this session. You have to remember that you can as a prime contractor you can put in requirements that you know best suit your business you know whether or not you follow the far which oh by the way let's make sure we dispel this myth that remember the federal acquisition regulation was actually written for government government acquisition officials it's not necessarily meant for government contractors the government may put uh, elements and clauses within the far within a prime contract and then the prime contractor then you know, has some required flow down clauses, and then there's some optional flow down clauses. So it's gonna be very important. Again, I, uh, uh, Jody emphasized at the end of her session, 
you know, read your contract. Well, not only read your contract, get a preview of that contract and don't be so quick to sign it and understand that some of those blowdowns, which may, you know, the, the prime contractor may argue as, well, it's in our contract, we must give it to you. It's not always the case. So whether it's uh, uh, an overly burdensome uh, insurance requirement, whether it's the contract type, because the prime has a cost plus contract, does not mean that the subcontract needs to be cost plus. Uh, whether it's a right to audit clause, does that actually make sense given the type of audit, type of subcontract you have? Pay attention to those flow down clauses because anything that's in your contract is what you need to follow as a subcontractor. Awesome, thank you. Next slide. So here we wanted to outline for everyone responsibilities as a prime and a sub. And I, I don't think we need to delve too much into the specifics here, but again, just to visualize for you everything that the speakers prior uh, to us have covered. Um, and just a quick summary, this isn't all encompassing, but also just for you to see from a prime contractor standpoint, you know, the prime contractor is ultimately responsible for the work that the subcontractor is doing. And what's important here, um, especially what the, you know, the pricing uh, speakers had, had noted is that they're responsible for keeping track of all of the quotes that are coming in, making sure that that pricing aligns with their estimate and that they're making sure also that they're flowing down the right requirements for, flaw, for clauses, um, which will then basically be a signal to the subcontractor of what they have to make sure that they're keeping track of. Essentially, the contract file that each the prime and the subcontractor are holding have to encompass all of the work that they're holding. So documentation, documentation, documentation is key here. And I, and I know we've heard that theme over and over and over again over the past uh, few presenters. Um, additionally, I think what's also important is to make sure that subcontractors are invoicing regularly and that they're invoicing in accordance with their subcontract. Um, one of the stories that I have to share is I was working with a small company um, not too long ago, and they actually asked me, they said, well, my prime is paying me. Do I really have to invoice them? And I said, yes, please invoice <laughs> and please make sure you reconcile your invoices to make sure you're being paid the right amount. It's great that money's coming in, but you have to make sure that you're also uh you know, you're also following your contract. And similar to the, what the legal uh, presenters had said, you have to read your contract. You have to know what your requirements are. And uh, even if you're getting paid, you need to make sure that you're getting paid in accordance with what was promised to you and that you're keeping all of that documentation again in your file because if an audit happens, um, and I can feel Jeff like scratching his forehead uh, with his experience with audits as well. If an audit happens, all of those documents are going to matter for you from a compliance standpoint. Uh, over to you, Jeff. Yeah, no, I, I, thank you for harping on the documentation standards. I mean, whether it's if you're a prime, you know, whether or not you're maintaining uh, those doc documentation in accordance with your certified purchasing system or if you're just being ready or being on the subcontractor side, you know, why did you make that purchase? Why did you uh, change uh, your travel? Uh, you know, whatever it may be, that documentation is gonna save you because ultimately, and I don't wanna get too ahead of myself on the audit side, uh, you know, it's, it's that documentation that will be reviewed two, three, four, dare I say six years later, uh, and is everyone who, understood that documentation that that or the events that happen you know are they going to still going to be there and be able to find where those documents are so it's coming up with a a systematic uh, way of uh, organizing your documents your contract documentation maintaining uh, a singular uh, way of, of, of classifying your contract documents so that you know whoever is in the, that contracting position whoever is in those co compliance monitoring position you know, they know where the, where to find all this. So let me talk a bit about, you know, subcontract monitoring and the FAR requirements related to that. Uh, prime contract, I can't tell you how many audits I've been through where, you know, we, you know, we'll test a, a t and contract and look at the 10 different labor categories that are in your prime contract. And you list out those, those 10 light labor categories, they 
they're well defined within your prime contractor. You've done you've done your diligence and actually flowed the, that same LCAT descriptions down to your subcontracts. Uh, when I come in as an auditor, now putting my auditor hat on, or I have seen this in the past, is you know I, I would ask the question, hey, how did you make sure that your subcontractor was following those ten labor categories? And I can't tell you how many times I, I've had folks come back and say, uh, wait. I just trusted them. They said that they're a, a, a software engineer three, uh, and you know we accepted it. Or, yeah, I reviewed that resume when we first got it three years ago. Uh, you know, and you know, so I so we figured that you know a year later we can upgrade into system engineers four. Whatever it may be, I, I want to make it very clear. Guess who's going to get in trouble uh, when an audit is done in the future? Uh, if that labor category requirements were not followed, it's going to be the prime contractor. And yes, your prime contractor should make sure you have those candid discussions, not too different from what uh, Marsha and, and, and Mike were talking about earlier. You know, understanding the flow of business, the flow of documentation, how are you going to maintain your compliance with your contract regarding labor categories? I can't tell you, there's been way too many cases uh, where there's been false claim. Act, uh, actions taken against contractors who don't do sufficient monitoring over the labor categories, whether it's their own or it's their subcontractors. Because you have a subcontractor, you just can't alleviate the responsibility uh, of proper uh, costs and hours being claimed on a contract just because they said so. Or, uh, well, I looked at their invoice and it looked right. Oh, I've been working with them for a number of years. That, that person totally has those capabilities. Maintain those resumes. Check on get, getting get updated resumes. Uh, if you issue uh, a, a cost type subcontract to a subcontractor, are you asking that subcontractor, "Hey, can you give me evidence that you have a, a, an adequate accounting system? You know, can you give me that DCMA uh, certification that your accounting system is adequate? Can you give me your ACO uh, certification?" Or, hey, did you go out and have it assessed by a third party CPA firm? You know, whatever it may be, it's gonna be on you as a prime contractor. If you did insufficient subcontract for monitoring, you're just gonna put more uh, audit risk on yourself. You're gonna have more contract risk on yourself uh, if you're found to be delinquent in, in monitoring your subcontracts. And, you know, now talking for people who are looking to be subcontractors, you know, look at that proposed subcontract type. Does it make sense for your business? Do you, I, I, Mike mentioned it several times in his presentation. Do you want to have those additional requirements for that cost plus contract? Does it really, is it really required? Is the scope well defined? Do you know exactly what you're going to build? If that's the case, fix price, ask for it. You, you can always push back. You, it's all part of the negotiation until that subcontractor is signed off on you can change the rules. You can change the terms by which you're you're supposed to follow in order to perform under the contract. So please keep that in mind. Uh, and and honestly, that subcontract is can be an evolving document. You you start performing under the contract and you see an overly burdensome term, start having open that dialogue with the prime contracting officer and talk about well, we're doing this one thing that's making us. Uh, have too much of a burden and we're incurring so much indirect cost to maintain compliance can we talk about something else we can do so have those conversations be honest with yourself and understand where the risk how can you lower your risk i want to get back to uh, tan's point on that how do you lower your risk and that is by monitoring what's in your contract and how, how you're being asked to deliver uh do you have anything else on this before we move on i was just going to add one thing um just to again echo what you're saying is have those conversations um, to say that it's okay to have these conversations during your teaming agreement uh, conversations and see how much of this you can negotiate in your teaming agreement um, because that could save you um, especially if you're talking pricing or if you're talking about responsibilities or contract type some of those things you can negotiate there that you can then leverage during your subcontract negotiations and you can also test the water a little bit with your prime to see um you know how how agreeable are they to working with you it's a great test to the relationship early on 
Um, and you can also, you know, pick up some good signals from what they're giving you while you're discussing those types of um, those types of arrangements. So just wanted to also add that in that, you know, sometimes you don't have to wait until the subcontract. You can actually start having some of those conversations uh, prior to the subcontract agreement. Oh, yeah. How many arguments have you seen, Dolores, with a uh, work share? How about that topic? Uh Oh yeah, that um, <laughs> that has saved a lot of heartache um, very early on uh, to handle the business side first before going through the teaming agreement negotiations, where it saved hours. Um, if if the you know if the business people can have the conversation about work share and if it's a no go, then it saves time for me as the contract manager because I don't have to go through the whole you know rigmarole of negotiating that teaming agreement if we can't even agree what work share we're gonna have. <laughs> exactly, yeah, uh, I, trying to be that arbiter in those rooms can be, can be pretty tough. Uh, yes. yes. Well defined in your teaming agreement, you're, it's gonna be tough to maintain it in your actual subcontract, uh, I'll say that. Um, but again, you know, developing that relationship, this is a relationship business, and I think a lot of our previous speakers would agree with me there. Uh, and ultimately, you guys can work everything out, because one day you're the subcontractor to prime it's going to be flipped another day all right if nothing else on this let's move to our last slide which will we have plenty of time to talk about how did that happen all right <laughs> let's talk about audits i, I it, yes this is my life frequently um but i'm here to tell you you shouldn't be afraid of an audit you should expect it I, i've had too many times where I, you know, I started getting on a call with with a, an oddity, whether it was requested by the government or requested by a prime contractor. It's like, what are you doing calling me? What's this all about? And I point them to their FAR clause that talks about the right to audit. That's that FAR 52 section that uh, Susan and Jody unfortunately had to skip over. But let me tell you, those FAR 52 clauses are pretty darn important. And, and even if they're just addressed in, in reference only, Make sure you understand and see those. And so uh, you should see a right to audit clause if you have a flexibly priced contract. What does that mean, Jeff? That's a TNM contract is deemed a flexibly priced contract. Cost, any, any cost reimbursable contract can be deemed a flexibly priced contract. Even a fixed price incentive uh, contract can be deemed as flexibly priced. So what, what, what could you see as a result uh, uh, as having those contract types? Well, let me talk. So on that case, you're going to be worried more about these, what I would call post-award, meaning after you, you receive the award of the contract, or at least when the prime gets a contract, and then you subsequently get your uh, subcontract awarded to you, when would you expect those kinds of post-award audits? Well, I'm here to unveil to you a, a, maybe a nasty surprise if you weren't thinking about it, but you agree to a cost plus contract and you're thinking, hey, no problem. This is my only cost plus contract. It's with the prime contractor. I, who's going to come and audit me? DCA can't look at me. I don't have any DOD contracts or some other CPA firms aren't going to look at me, right? Well, I'm here to tell you potentially wrong because if you have, again, that right to audit clause is going to keep you open to audit whoever it may be from. And so prime contractors, that's an, again, coming going back to my subcontractor uh, monitoring uh, cautions from earlier, you, you got to ask. Who's going to be auditing those indirect rates? Who's going to audit those direct costs claimed in your subcontracts? And you want to make sure that that subcontract, do they have a, a direct uh, prime relationship with the contract where the government will be actually auditing them? Or, well, they only have fixed price with the government as a prime contractor. Prime, the government's probably not going to do that audit. Guess who gets to do the audit, prime contractor? Yes, I'm sorry to say that you're likely going to be responsible. And I, I, I have worked for several large prime contractors where they've had to learn that lesson nastily. We went to go close out the contract and the government asked them, hey, you know, what have you done with your subcontractors? Make sure those indirect rates were, were fine. Well, I don't have proof video over it. Um, well, you're right. But uh, guess what? Uh, I, I didn't audit that contract. The government contracting officer would say, so uh, get to it. So there goes a delayed contract closeout. There goes that uh, fee you were hoping to collect that the government was setting aside to pay to you, and you have now lengthen your government closeout uh, your government contract closeout by maybe many months, maybe a year or more. So be very careful with, with decisions that are made about contract type and, and what you're getting yourself into. So same thing for subcontractors. You know, be ready for those audits, and so. 
when you do get that audit call, you know, understanding what the audit is all about, what you potentially could be subject to, you know, you could still be subject to what's called a floor check or labor verification audit. Yeah, you're a subcontractor, you're charging labor hours on a contract, you're sitting side by side with prime contractors and other government folks, you know, on site somewhere. Uh, yeah, a DCA or another audit representative may come around and ask you to see your timesheet and ask you what you've been working on. That's a post-award audit that you could, you, you could absolutely be subject to. Uh, same thing for if you're buying materials. Uh, if you're a subcontractor buying stuff, again, uh, uh, that purchase existence type audit could happen. Let me talk a little bit more about the pre-award side. Uh, I think uh, Mike and Marsha referenced about you know the potential for certified cost of pricing data. Yeah, you're involved in some kind of sole source uh, change proposal that, that a prime catcher went through, they're likely gonna submit a cert certified cost of pricing data based proposal that's you know over seven and a half million to the government. And the government's gonna say, well, now that you've been awarded, it's no longer competition. I wanna make sure I'm getting a fair and reasonable price. I'm gonna go task my DCA auditor go, to go take a look to make sure that you know this is all good. Even this is even even if this is a fixed price contract. So not only is a prime subject to a potential pre-award audit, you as a subcontractor could be uh, asked for proprietary data from that government auditor, and you should, you know, that you know, a good, sub well-written subcontract should recognize that, and that's why you may have to uh, talk directly with government auditors and tell them about how you built up those indirect rates, how did you come up with that pricing? Again, going back to Marsha and Mike's uh, discussion, you know, maintaining that documentation, how did you arrive to those prices? How did you uh, uh, figure out what labor mix uh, to, to propose. Did you base it on historical actuals? Did you base it on quotes that you got from vendors that you're working with? I, there's so many different ways that it can go, but you need to be ready. Uh, this should not come as a surprise. So knowing that these audits could happen, you know, I can't guarantee you whether they will or will not happen, but you have to acknowledge and understand that in certain types of situations, you could have an audit. Heck, I'll even give you the fair warning that under competitive source selections, again, read the RFP because there's new uh, requirements from certain agencies, and I've seen this done now by Department of Energy, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, where they put it in somewhat fine print within the section L of the uh, RFP saying, we may send a designated individual or a company or a set of auditors to take a look at your pricing to determine if it's realistic and reasonable and complete. So again, that's another situation where it's probably gonna be approached that similar to an audit, asking you all for the, your basis of estimates and how you came up to them. So uh, have you, I think I'm making it pretty clear here, Dolores, that you know understanding what you're getting yourself into, whether it's via the RFP or via your, your subcontract, knowing what you could be at risk at from an audit perspective is gonna be pretty clear from the very beginning. So when the audit does come, you're ready to support it. And yes, I'm, maybe I'm talking selfishly when I'm an auditor, but I'm telling you for you as a subcontracting uh, official, making sure that you keep your prime happy by being audit ready, uh, that's great. Uh, that's, that's only gonna help you, uh, enable you to succeed going forward. And who should do those audits, like I mentioned, you know, most of the time it is the government if they have uh, cognizance over your your entity. Uh, even when you're a subcontractor, they, they may do it. But like I said, it could be a representative from the prime contractor. Then what happens if a is subcontractor claims an unallowable cost and the prime, you know, pushes that through? Again, I'm going to talk and remind you, that's why prime contractor do your due diligence. I think we heard that theme several times uh, from the very beginning in the market research section understand what the capabilities of that subcontractor have and you know what is what's the chances that they may submit an unallowable cost through you because if they do guess who's on the line to pay back the government no 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 the subcontractor can't pay the government directly they don't have a contract that's right it's going to go through you prime contractor and prime contractor you may have to pay the penalties you know again this is a case where you know a properly written subcontract will enable you to get recovery for
for the subcontractor if that happens. But, you know, do you still want to go through that pain of first being assessed that penalty and having to pay back those unallowable costs and interest that may accrue as a result? So be on, here's my fair warning to you. Uh, you're not going to be able to do your own audits. I get it. You're not going to be able to, to, to prepare for every contingency, right? So your job as a prime contractor is to help reduce risk as best as you can and to have those discussions and understandings of what the, the uh, sub will do to ensure that they don't pass through any cost that's not appropriate. And you should be fine. So again, let's talk a little bit about this uh, LCAT monitoring and best practices. Again, uh, I wanna remind you uh, that you know subcontractors, you need to maintain those resumes too. You need to be able to prove out that those individuals were charged in the right categories. Again, you could be subject to audit and have to pay back money related to those hours charged on the contract. And terminations, I, I, I would not be, re, I'd be remiss not to mention that terminations. Uh, and, and I guess in the same categories as, as changes, and, you know, it's an unusual thing that the power that the government, that this, the US federal government has, they can essentially terminate a prime contract for almost an, you know, any reason whatsoever, you know, whether, you know, usually that's for convenience, but you know they can do it for default if the prime contractor is not doing what they said they they would do. Um, in that case, yeah, the, the the government could say, hey, listen, we don't we no longer have the funding. We thought we were, this was going to go five years. We're now going to have to cut it off here in the middle of the second year. Well, now what? Uh, you know, the prime has uh, will should have the clause that should enable them to recover reasonable costs for shutting down an operation, you know, say if you leased a building, you know, that was specifically used for this contract and oh no, you know, when the termination happened, you're not able to, you know, sublet out that space or, you know, terminate the lease timely, you're now on the hook for a huge liability. Now what? Well, you could be, as a prime contractor, you'd be entitled to, to recover those costs from the government. You know, what, well, what happens if the subcontractor does something similar to that? And there's many different ways you can, situations, but the lease is the easiest example that I, I can give on this webinar. And we can talk about other situations on another webinar. But in the meantime, you know, the prime and the subcontractor need to talk about what if this contract gets terminated? What will you do? What will we do if that happens? Will you, if I'm a subcontractor, will you give me enough time to prepare my claim that you can then provide to the government. Uh, you, you, so there's certain time parameters that, that prime contractors have to submit a termination claim and you know, making sure that the subcontractor does its part, which often is the proverbial long pole in the tent, uh, getting that information, getting the help they need in order to, to, to build that claim, you know, it, 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 it is an iterative process. Uh, it's going to take the subcontractor doing its own work. It's going to take a lot of time for the prime and the sub to do its own work because, again, ultimately the responsibility and who submits that termination claim is on that prime contractor. And if that prime, who is, oh, by the way, certifying a claim and that claim contains something that doesn't belong there, yeah, there, there could be problems, uh, you know, for in, in a number of different instances that, you know, if they claim a cost that doesn't belong there, it's inappropriate, it's unallowable. Uh, it's unreasonable, uh, many different ways that the recovery won't be as uh, good as the uh, prime had hoped. All right, I think I talked a lot there. Dolores, do you have anything to add on your audit and compliance experience here? Um, all I would say, I think here, just to wrap it up too, is uh, if you want to do like an internal check on yourself to see if you're following the processes, um, read the contract, make sure you have all your documentation, make sure you have the file ready and uh, go through that and, and see if from an objective standpoint, if you can piece together why decisions were made the way they were made and if everything matches, um, you know, the contract mods all match up to uh, the numbers that you have, you've checked the math, all of that. Um, it should be a self-check every single time you get a mod to make sure that you're uh, compliant, that you're consistent. Uh, and then if, you know, if an audit comes, when it comes, you know, you, you get the notice. And so you can do an internal audit yourself. Um, so 
rely on the resources that you have within your organization to check those things. And if you need best practices, you know, there's uh, there's lots of resources for you. And this entire um, this entire like cohort of speakers here would most likely be willing to help you at least to navigate what to look for first. So uh, audits are fun. Always keep them in the back of your mind. They do happen. They're inevitable, uh, like taxes and death, I guess. <laughs> um, so just be ready for one when it happens. Love it. And, and, let me, and Jennifer, if, if my closing remark is just that you are going to make mistakes and it's okay. If you discover it on, my, on your own, say something. And that goes for primes or, or subcontractors. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Appreciate the time. Great. Thanks, Dolores. Thanks, Jeff. It was great to uh, have you both on the program today and a lot of um, wonderful and valuable content that you've shared with us. So uh, again, thank you. Um, we've got a list here of all the speakers. Their email addresses were at the beginning of their sessions. All of the power or the PowerPoint is already up and uh, posted on slideshare.net and today's recording <coughs> excuse me will be on our YouTube channel if you go over to our website which is jennifershouse.com in the top right hand corner you'll see a link to YouTube uh, just click on that uh, that should add you as a subscriber to the YouTube channel and you'll get a notification as soon as today's webinar is uploaded um, if you've got questions for any of the speakers on anything that they covered, you can obviously contact them directly. Uh, again, their contact information is on the slides, and the slides are on SlideShare. We'll send that out um, probably tomorrow morning uh, with those links. Uh, this session today kicked off what is going to start next week on Wednesday, where we're going to profile the top 40 federal contractors. You can see the bullet points there at the top, uh, which will be the details that we're going to cover. Here's the schedule, which you can find on our website. So every Wednesday at noon Eastern, uh, these are the companies uh, that are doing the most business with the U.S. government, and we will go through them um, accordingly there. Uh, each of the registration links is on our website. We do have advertising and sponsorship opportunities, so feel free to uh, check those out. Uh, our spring soiree is actually Monday, March 20th. It's not a Friday, so we apologize for the typo there. Uh, Monday, March 20th, we expect about 200 to 250 federal government contractors. We do have opportunities to uh, sponsor the event. We'll give you a table, a couple tickets to the event. Um, your logo on our marketing materials, which reach about 25,000 plus federal contractors. If you've got questions, um, you can go over to the hello at Jennifer Schaus or on our website. If you go to the event section, you'll find the um, event listed there. Again, today's webinar was recorded. There's the link to our YouTube channel. And thanks to all of our speakers. I thought they did a fantastic job. And thanks to everybody who took time out of their day to join us for the webinar this afternoon. Uh, that concludes our webinar. So thank you, and we'll see you uh, again at another webinar soon.